Good afternoon. I'm Peter Ku, Chair of the Committee on Parks and Recreation, and I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to this hearing, which will examine how we can best maintain our city's park system. Over the course of the last few decades, the city gradually reduced its contributions to the park system as the shares of park funding in city budget uh, fell from a height of one and a half point of in the 1960s to the uh, 0 0.86 percent in the mid 80s and to half a percent of the budget of 2013. Recent years have seen a slight reversal of the train, of that train. However, while the recent parks budget was the largest ever in terms of dollar amount at about $580 million, it, is still, only, it still only represents 0.6% of the entire expense budget. The trend over the last few decades have been to rely on more private dollars to fund our parks, which decreased the political will of the city to properly fund the parks department, resulting in stagnant public parks budgets that have limited the ability to properly maintain our parks. The lack of resources is clear. For example, as of 2017, the city spent about $178 per capita on its parks, while other cities like Washington, D.C. and Minneapolis spent $270 and $233 per capita, respectively. Uh, additionally, the past department the past department's recommended maintenance needs went up 143% between fiscal year 2006 and fiscal year 2016, from $40 million to almost $34 million. However, in fiscal year 2016, only 12% of their request was actually funded, which was one of the lowest rates among all city agencies. Staffing rates have also suffered from a high in the 1976 of about 11,000 full-time employees. The full-time staff dropped to an average of about 700, no, to about 7,500 recently, with some slight increases recently of about 11% from 2014 to 2016. The harm done to a parks from this lack of maintenance resources is clear. Numerous reports cite infrastructure issues with park bridges, drainage systems, and park bathrooms. For example, a recent controller's report found that many comfort stations are in disrepair. Out of the 1,428 parks uh, department bathrooms, Nearly 400 sinks, toilets, walls, ceilings, changing tables, among other features, were damaged or missing during the latest inspection. The past department has done a good job working with the limited, with the little that they have, but I think we as a city can do better. While the city while the council and the administration have worked together to recently increase the past budget and fund new programs to away parks, such as the Community and Anchor Parks Initiative, there is simply no avoiding the fact that we need to begin restoring the city's past budget back to historic levels. That is why I was a supporter of the pay fair initiative and other work at the council to vastly increase the past budget. Through this year's budget process, 
we were able to add $44 million in new funding for the past system. This funding will, ha will help to hire more park maintenance workers and, and an additional 40, no, an addition, I'm sorry, an additional 50 urban park rangers, as additional, an additional 80 parks and post, 80 parks enforcement patrol uh, officers. More funding for forestry management and additional funds for all community gardens. While there was a major achievement, it is not enough. If we are to truly ensure that our parks have all the resources they need, this funding will, at a minimum, need to be baseline in future budgets so that we may continue the work to develop more of the budget to bring our parks to a level of quality that all New Yorkers deserve. I look forward to discussing these issues at today's hearing and examining what other possibilities are out there to continue on the path of greater equity for all our parts. Thank you. Now I ask the council to administer the oath. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? I do. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. You may start your testimony. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. I have to announce the presence of our uh, park, member, uh, park, uh, park committee members, uh, Council Member Adams, Council Member Pavelli, Council Member Eric, Council Member Van Bremer, Council Member Moyer, Council Member Levine, and Council Member Cohen. And Council Member Carrera. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Ku, members of the Parks Committee, and other members of the City Council. I am Mitchell Silver, Commissioner of New York City Parks. Joining me today is the agency's first Deputy Commissioner, Liam Cavanaugh, as well as Mark Folk, our Deputy Commissioner and Chief Operating Officer, and our Director of Government Relations, Matt Jury. Firstly, we would like to express our congratulations to Councilmember Ku for presiding over his first meeting as Parks Committee Chair, and to Councilmember Adams and Rivera on their nomination to the Parks Committee. <laughs> We've had the pleasure of working closely together for the past few years on issues important to your districts and look forward to working with you more specifically on the issues and policies being examined by the committee. Thank you all for allowing us the opportunity today to discuss the agency's maintenance and operational practices. With a portfolio of over 30,000 acres, NYC Parks is responsible for the maintenance and upkeep of nearly 4,500 individual properties, ranging from parks and playgrounds to ball fields and green streets. Keeping these parks in good condition requires the focused attention of thousands of employees who consistently labor on the ground and behind the scenes to make sure New Yorkers can fully enjoy our portfolio of picturesque spaces which are envied across the country, if not the world. The administration recently released the Mayor's Management Report, or MMR, for fiscal year 2019, which tracks progress in our agency's primary services and goals, including our focus on ensuring that all parks and playgrounds are clean and in good condition. We're pleased to highlight for the second year in a row our ratings for overall park condition and cleanliness either increased or held steady across all park categories. We are pleased to be here today to offer the Council an overview of our maintenance approach so you can better understand the successes we've achieved as well as the challenges we face. Over the course of this administration, NYC Parks has evolved into a more modern, data-driven, innovation-focused organization and improving our operational practices has been a primary focus of my time as agency commissioner. I'm proud to have created a new agency leadership role 
held by the Deputy Commissioner, Mark Folk, which is now the, he is now the Chief Operating Officer, Chief Operating Officer, who works in close coordination with the first Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh to standardize our maintenance efforts across the city and improve our management practices, providing a more enjoyable park experience for all New Yorkers. Under their supervision, the agency is able to execute its maintenance strategy in a thoughtful and targeted manner. We have invested in technology to help us be more effective using detailed data metrics to improve efficiency of our mobile cleaning routes, providing handheld devices to our operations staff on the ground to report and track their efforts in real time improving our process for work order implementation, and reorganizing our borough storehouses for the park's equipment and supplies. We've also changed our approach to maintenance and staff deployment. For example, we all know that many of our parks and playgrounds are heavily used seven days a week. In previous years, many of these hotspot parks were only being cleaned five days a week resulting in overflowing garbage bins and litter strewn throughout parks come Monday morning. In this administration, we have reconfigured our staffing patterns to provide additional maintenance on weekends, focusing on the 100 most intensely used parks, the hotspots. Another traditional challenge we faced was managing the redeployment of park employees that step up during the peak summer season to take on seasonal positions at beaches and pools to address the various operational and maintenance needs of those very busy summer destinations. This redeployment had been something of a strain on our agency resources in light of the longer daylight hours and increased usage at other park properties outside of beaches and pools. So the mayor provided $12 million in baseline expense funding in fiscal year 2017 budget for parks to increase our seasonal district staffing levels through the summer peak season to offer our one-for-one -one step in replacement for those temporarily vacated maintenance and operation positions. And we could continue to maintain our parks and playgrounds on busy summer days to the standard we have all come to expect. I would now like to introduce the Deputy Commissioner, Mark Folk, to outline in more detail how our daily maintenance efforts are structured and managed. Thank you, Commissioner Silver, and good afternoon. Chairman Koo and members of the committee. I'm Mark Folk, I'm Parks Deputy Commissioner and Chief Operating Officer. The Maintenance and Operations of Parks, or MNO as we refer to it, staff for New York City Parks varies in size throughout the year, expanding with seasonal hires during our peak park usage in warmer months. Depending on the time of year, the agency employs between 3,000 and 5,300 MNO staff members with an FY20 operational budget of $230 million. Full-time, year-round staff constitute a large portion of our workforce, but we also benefit from partnerships with fellow city agencies to create employment opportunities. Our signature program, the Parks Opportunity Program, or POP, hires applicants referred by the Human Resources Administration Department of Social Services to clean and green our parks, playgrounds, and other cities, facilities citywide. These POP workers receive on-the-job training, career coaching, and specialized training opportunities during the six months they serve with parks, which help them to succeed both while at our agency and also helps them in their search for their next job. Our seasonal hires are vital members of our team, helping address conditions brought about during the seasons, such as cutting grass, raking leaves, shoveling snow, et cetera, as well as preparing for season-specific park uses enjoyed by the public, such as ball fields, beaches, and pools. Both the POP and the seasonal workers are a critical pipeline to the entry-level city park worker or CPW position. In terms of organizational structure, individual parks and properties are managed into 75 park districts, which largely correspond to, the, to community board district boundaries. Those are overseen by park supervisors who manage crew chiefs, CPWs, and other employees. These park districts are then organized into 45 park sectors, which are overseen by park managers, and those sectors are further clustered into 14 park regions overseen by our regional managers. These regional operation efforts are then organized into the five individual boroughs, which are led by a chief of operations and a borough commissioner who report to myself and first deputy commissioner Kavanaugh. 
Borough operations staff care for our parks every day and serve as our eyes and ears on the ground, observing any problematic conditions and tackling them head on. As Commissioner Silver mentioned, our work is compiled, is completed by staff, is tracked in real time using what is called a daily tasks app on mobile devices, which are supplied by parks to our employees. This includes fixed post staff that are stationed in a single park location, as well as mobile crews that clean multiple parks in predetermined routes. Their work is monitored by supervisors who are also equipped with the mobile devices. The frequency of park cleaning varies depending on the nature, location, and intensity of use for each property. The frequency of, ma of maintenance is defined as what we call a service level agreement or an SLA. Parks which are highly used in well traffic areas receive five to seven visits a week. Those with moderate use are cleaned three to five times a week, and those with lesser use sites are maintained weekly or on an as needed basis. Beyond the daily maintenance efforts performed by district staff, certain tasks require additional resources or technical expertise. This is managed through our work order process, which are, which are uh, work required or routed to skilled tradespeople at both our borough shops and borough specialized crews. This could include targeted improvements and, and targeted repairs, excuse me, and improvements involving plumbing, electrical work, masonry, metal work, painting, as well as things like fence repair, pressure washing, and ball field grooming. These teams do not just reactively address concerns, they perform ongoing preventive maintenance and play a key role in many of our exciting strate uh, strategic initiatives. As part of the Community Parks Initiative, this administration's signature effort dedicated to park equity, our specialized crews implemented transformative targeted improvements, such as basketball court sports coding and nearly 100 parks and playgrounds throughout the city. They were also the linchpin in making our Cool Pools initiative a reality. Over the past two years, we gave a vibrant new look and feel to 11 outdoor pools in underserved neighborhoods throughout the city, which has seen few improvements um, since they were built in the 1970s. We utilize a creative approach to reactivate these pools by providing colorful art and cabana-style shade structures to help keep swimmers cool. This could not have been possible without the hard work of our specialized crews. Cool Pools has been a tremendous success, improving the outdoor pool experience so much that attendance increased 22% at the 11 cool pools, which people in these neighborhoods have begun to call their resorts. These borough-specific efforts are further bolstered by our citywide services division, which provides broader repair and maintenance services for our properties and facilities throughout the city, in, in things such as installing green roofs, addressing conditions at pool filter plants, replacing inefficient boilers. Additionally, our borough forestry teams are specifically dedicated to keeping our urban tree canopy in good condition, maximizing all of the environmental and social benefits of trees both in parks and along our streets. I also have to recognize our dedicated staff that manages our fleet, which range from small but durable four-wheel utility vehicles known as gators to heavy-duty pickup trucks, vans, and larger packers, which transport park trash to DSNY trash management facilities. Without these vehicles, transporting our staff between parks and within our larger parks would not be possible. This organizational structure allows the agency to have the ability to address maintenance and cleanliness concerns as they arise, but also ensure that we're marshalling our resources in a consistent and efficient manner across the five boroughs. Behind the scenes, the talented individuals of our innovation and performance management team work with data created by our operations staff to help us assess current practices and apply new approaches so that we can optimize our finite resources. Through their efforts, alongside ongoing internal review and analysis of our maintenance practices, we've been able to implement innovative maintenance approaches like assessing the efficiency of our routes being used by mobile crews and our zone man management maintenance approach, which has been successfully piloted in Cortona Park in the Bronx, as well as Fort Greene and McCarran Parks in Brooklyn. In addition to the on-the-ground observation and monitoring performed daily by <coughs> our staff, we also receive feedback directly from the public through 311, and these complaints are routed directly to our staff to address. Further, our park supervisors inspect every site in their park district on a monthly basis, and in addition to all this, New York City Parks is a separate division dedicated to performing independent inspections and reviews of our park properties to make sure they are in the best condition possible. The Park Inspection Program, known as PIP, is a comprehensive outcome-based performance measure system that generates detailed inspections of our parks and playgrounds managed by our Operations and Management Planning Division, independent from operations. 
PIP inspectors conduct annually 6,000 inspections using rigorous review of 16 different park features to develop park ratings, and each site is judged in both cleanliness and overall condition. Alongside local staff observ observations and 311 reports, these PIP ratings guide the agency's effort to target areas of concern and to efficiently utilize resources. PIP data for each park is fully available to the public via NYC Parks website, and the ratings are ultimately compiled and reported for each fiscal year in the Mayor's Management Report. As Commissioner Silver referenced earlier, in the most recent MMR for fiscal year 2019, the overall condition for parks was 90%, a substantial increase from the rating of 85% in fiscal year 2013, and our park cleanliness rating increased to 95%, a significant improvement over the 90% rating in FY13. More specifically, our inspection ratings focus on park litter during the past three summers has shown a six percentage point improvement since 2017. These positive outcomes are a reflection of our strategic efforts to more effectively allocate resources and monitor maintenance staff. We are very proud of the progress we have made. Regardless, we consistently seek to find new ways to improve our practices and procedures and give devoted employees the tools they need to care for their parks. To this end, we would like to thank the Council and the Playfair Coalition, led by New Yorkers for Parks, for their incredible support and advocacy for the agency, which led to the increased baseline funding Councilman Ku referenced for city park workers and gardeners, and additional one-time expense funding for the agency to provide more maintenance staff. This funding will help us to continue to deliver valuable resource, valuable services efficiently in a challenging economic environment. As hard as we work to maintain our parks, the, the agency cannot do it alone. Our staff are dedicated public servants but cannot be everywhere at all times and cannot always control how some people of the public treat their public spaces. With thousands of properties serving millions of visitors, we rely on New Yorkers to treat those spaces as they, as they would their own homes or backyards. And we hope the council will join us in reminding their constituents that they also have a responsibility to our parks and a role to, to play in keeping our city clean. On a similar note, I, would want to, I want to recognize the many volunteers and community organizations that take time out of their busy schedules to help beautify the green and open spaces dear to their hearts. We rely on the generous support from these volunteer stewards to create a positive environment in which people can interact with their parks and help make them even better places. Volunteers, such as those participating in the It's My Park program, spearheaded by Partnerships for Parks Division and co-administrated by the City of Parks Foundation, participated in volunteer events and programs at roughly 336 park locations last year, bringing New Yorkers closer to their parks and getting them even more engaged and invested. To conclude, we always welcome feedback from Council and to invite you to continue alerting us about incidents or maintenance concerns regarding the conditions of your local parks. We hope that the next time you visit a park, you will be able to smell the fresh air and enjoy the scenery with a comprehensive understanding of everything it takes to keep our parks in the best condition possible. Thank you for allowing us to testify before you today. We look forward to continuing to work with you to create and care for an incredible park system for New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Silver and Deputy Commissioner. Uh, we are joined by Councilmember King and uh, Councilmember Joyner. I will begin uh, asking a few questions and then the other members of the committee can ask questions. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner, Department of uh, DPR, Department of Parks and Recreation received $43 million in additional expense funding for the fiscal year two, 2020 budget. Can you specify how that funding is being allocated and how many positions have been filled today uh, with those funds? Well, thank you for the question, Council Member Ku. Uh, first, we are implementing the funds exactly as it was suggested. There were very specific categories with the 43 million, and including both baselining of existing staff that prior had only one-shot funding, which included CPWs and gardeners, and included funding for Green Thumb, for additional PEP officers, rangers, forest management framework, 
street tree stump removal, and beach and pool extension. Uh, all those programs are underway to go more specifically about some of the positions. Clearly, the baseline positions are now going from one shot to baseline is already underway. Uh, in terms of the specific uh, 50 uh, of 44 of the 50 rangers that were given uh, have now been hired. Uh, and I now would refer 52 of the 80 PEP officers uh, have also been hired and will be starting the academy. And uh, I will now refer to Commissioner Folk for some of the specific numbers on the, those CPWs and gardeners. So Thank of the you. 100 CPW City Park workers that were one-time one time funding, they've all been hired. Um, so we've hired full 100 of them. And of the 50 gardeners, we're about halfway through hiring the gardeners. The gardeners are a more select position. Uh, it's taking a bit longer to hire the gardeners. Uh, how many positions remain to be filled? And what is the timeline to fill those positions? Well, in terms of both the PEP and the Rangers, uh, we're always in the process of receiving applicants. These are very specialized positions. They require qualifications and background checks. So our expectation is we're going to fill these in as quickly as possible. But as I stated, for those positions, uh, there are 52, so there are 38 left for PEP hires and six left for Ranger hires. And again, I'll defer to Commissioner Folk for the numbers. Uh, I believe he shared with you already the process that we've had most of them hired to date. Gardeners are the one that will take a little bit more time because it is a specialized position. For the remaining gardener positions, we're currently interviewing for those, and we expect to fill the positions uh, definitely before the end of the calendar year. Thank you. Yeah. According to the Center for, uh, for an Urban, according to the Center for an Urban Futures report on park infrastructure, DPR had a staff of over 11,642 in the 1970s. Uh, at the height of the fiscal uh, crisis. So what is the current full and part-time maintenance workforce? Now. So for maintenance, the full, uh, the full count ranges between 3,000, about 3,000 employees, and then during our peak season, which we're just coming off of the summer, we increased to about 53, 5,500 employees with our seasonal employees. That's the operations component of employees. Uh, what is this number broken down by borough or by park district? Yeah. We can provide that information. Yeah. I'm happy to follow up and we can provide that information after this meeting. Oh. And can you tell me like, what are the most common challenges or the biggest obstacles to keep uh, our parks clean and, uh, and parks and our playgrounds well, ma well maintained? Mm. Well, couldn't say there's a challenge. It's just that our parks are heavily used. Uh, we roughly get about 130 million visits per year. And as a result of that usage, uh, people tend to have litter that's there, they intend to use our parks. So it's just part of our operation to handle for that volume of traffic. As the Deputy Commissioner stated, we have service level agreements. Based on the usage of the park, we send crews out to clean it. So we know those that are more heavy trafficked clearly uh, is more challenged, and so we go out there to make sure we give it the proper service on a weekly basis, in some cases multiple times during the week. Uh, we just want to make sure we communicate that to the public, we're always looking to make sure we're putting the trash receptacles in the proper place so we minimize the litter that is placed in our parks. Uh, but certainly it is part of our daily routine. We want people to use our parks and we have to make sure we keep up with that demand to keep them clean. So I wouldn't say it's a challenge, it's just something we have to do as our normal operation. From a technology side, we want to analyze to make sure what routing works, staffing patterns work to make sure we maintain our park system. Thank you. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to ask something in my district. Yeah, in a uh, in a letter in my letter dated September 16, I, I wrote to the parks department regarding lead paint and asbestos in parks facilities, uh, especially ones used by young children, 
like pools and skating uh, rings. Can you share with me if the parks department has found evidence of lead and asbestos in parks facilities? Well, as you know, uh, lead was outlawed as use in New York City in the 1960s. And so uh, the pools, for example, those are scraped and cleaned interior almost every year. There's no longer a practice of using lead paint. Uh, if it is a rare case that we discover it, we address it and remediate it immediately. Uh, asbestos, for example, is typically in locations, subsurface, where there's boiler rooms where it's no contact with the public. Our staff is well aware whether we do a capital project, we will do some testing and assessment to make sure if there's the existence of asbestos. If there is, that is also remediated. We want to make sure that the public is not any in danger of both lead paint or asbestos in park facilities. Um, the pumps at Kisena Pass Lakes are constantly uh, blinking, and um, and we have uh, we have been uh, we are hearing reports of toxic algae. What is the past department uh, uh, doing to to uh, change this to uh, to address this? Well, well, first I just want to clarify for the record: there was some stories over the summer. Uh, no individuals or dogs were harmed by any toxic algae in the city of New York. This has been a problem both here in New York and across the country. I'm pleased to say that we've been doing extensive research and we'll be launching a pilot uh, this fall in Prospect Park uh, called it Eco Wheel to see whether that approach uh, will work. The good news is that uh, toxic algae is weather dependent. You'll start to see it dissipate as the weather gets colder. But clearly with climate change and the increase in heat uh, in our cities, we're keeping a close eye. So we're doing the research, working with our partners to determine exactly what we can do to reduce the toxic algae. In addition, we encourage people to keep their dogs on leash in these locations. We have signage throughout those parks. Uh, we are optimistic that what we're going to attempt in Prosper Park will be successful, and then we can deploy it to other parks throughout our park system. Okay, I'm gonna uh, uh, some of my members uh, to ask questions. Council Member Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner, very good to see you as always. And uh, we welcome you and your Deputy Commissioner, Commissioner Director, here today to offer testimony. Um, just have a few questions for you. According to, um, okay, that's not what we wanted to ask. How does the agency determine where fixed post crews are allocated or stationed? Well, I'm gonna to refer to uh, either one of the deputy commissioners. We just wanna clarify maybe an explanation of what fixed post versus mobile means. Please. And it's staff dedicated to parks. Hmm? We do within quote unquote fixed post parks also have mobile crews within them. Uh, but it does require one, a park house or a field house where uh, supplies can be stored. Uh, but then we look at the nature of the park, and we do have some parks that have zone management, but I'll defer now uh, to one of the deputy commissioners to, to answer your question. Councilman, the primary focus for fixed post staff are two things. One, as the commissioner just said, is there a physical place to fix post staff? So we need a park that has a building in it so that staff literally has a place to go to hang up their hat and store supplies and equipment. So fixed post, you need a bricks and mortar building. And then the second thing is the site needs to be large enough in order to have a full day's worth of work in order to fix post the staff there. Those are the two primary uh, factors that we look at when choosing where to fix post staff. I do wanna note that we fix post more staff in the summer because again, when we exponentially grow the volume of park workers we have out there in our peak season, we simply have more staff to fix posts. So during the summer, we fix post more staff at heavily used playgrounds and other sites that may not be fixed post in the off season. Thank you very much for the clarity. Uh, and, and likewise, Deputy Commissioner, and speaking of staff, in your, uh, in your testimony, you reference seasonal hires and how vital they are um, to shoveling snow, raking leaves, et, et cetera, and just maintaining the parks uh, um, overall. How much of the agency's maintenance and operations work is done by seasonal or temporary staff? So our, the staff that is working in maintenance doubles in the summer. So again, we have about 3,300 full-time employees and we generally pull in about 3,400 
uh, plus or minus um, seasonal staff. So we about double in size during our peak season. Those numbers are separate from the POP, the Parks Opportunity Program employees that we have engaged in operations year round. That's kind of a steady number through the 12 months. I'm sorry, yeah, I keep referring to peak season. So for peak season for us is obviously the summer. It generally starts, our staff starts to ramp up, our seasonal staff starts to ramp up as early as mid to late March through April. By mid, by mid May, we're fully staffed for our season. Come mid September, we start to ramp down. And by November 1st, we're out of what we consider our peak season and we're back to our off season staff levels. Okay, and what does the training look like for seasonal or temporary workers? So um, each grouping of uh, seasonal workers are trained in their respective boroughs consistent with what their title is. So if they're a CPW, the entrance level position, when they come in there's a tra training program done by the operation staff in the borough to which they're assigned. And I just have one more question for you. It has to do with friends of groups. Um, partnerships with New York City Parks Department. Can you explain how the role of private organizations such as Friends of Groups and Park Foundations differ from the role of DPR regarding park maintenance and improvement? Well, it, it varies. Uh, we have levels of conservancy and Friends of Relationships. You have one, for example, like Central Park Conservancy, which we have a license agreement. They do the bulk of the maintenance and operations, although there are still some New York City Park staff work in those parks. Then you have some hybrids like Prospect Park where they have some staff that they hire, but we have a significant number of parks employees also working in park staff with a manager overseeing park operations. So, and so there's just a shared responsibility. They do hire some and pay for workers, but there's also City of New York workers there as well. For the friends of groups, these are more volunteer efforts to do strategic cleanups. It could be weekly, it could be more than that. Uh, but those parks are still maintained by New York City, but it is offset by the work done by volunteer groups, but it tends to be very specific in what they're good at doing. Uh, so it may be gardening, it may be raking of leaves, it may be planting um, of flowers, uh, it just varies. Uh, so again, it depends on the friends group and what their capacity is, but as was stated, we do have an organization partnership with parks, which works with all those friends groups, and so they do supplement some of the work uh, but it may vary from once a week to once a month to seasonally, but it does add a great deal of value to maintaining our park system. Sure. And, and I said that was my last question, but of course you just made my brain uh, spark. Uh, so uh, with regard to relationships with parks and the, those types of groups, how does that, how is that relationship usually honed between those groups and the parks department? It is a very strong relationship, and I also want to include a lot of the private sector service days. We have organizations coming in doing specialized cleaning. It is a very treasured relationship. Uh, we value the relationship, uh, we recognize them, we reward them, we come out ourselves to stand by them to clean. Uh, I'll always say a park that has a friends group does far better than those that don't. And so we understand their love for that public space, their guardians as well, it is a value to the city, and that's why we applaud them recognize them and support them in any way that we can, offering training. Uh, there's ways that we are fiduciary agent, in some cases, to holding some of their funds if they're a very small nonprofit. So it was a very tight relationship between our friends group and the New York City Parks and City Parks Foundation. Okay, thank you for your testimony. We're gonna speak more, I'm sure, in the future about parks in my district, District 28. We've got Baisley Pond Park, very beautiful park. We've got some smaller parts which need some work and some help. So thank you for your testimony. I look forward to our continued thank you. relationship. If I could add, Councilwoman, if there is ever a time that a group wants to start a friends group, let us know. We'll be out there. We're always looking for new groups and are willing to lend our support with resources to help them thrive and grow. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Commissioner, I want to ask you about a, a couple of the local questions again. Uh, my office received frequent complaints about lawns not being mowed uh, for weeks at local neighborhood parks, including an uh, old town of Flushing Burial Ground and Peck Park. Is molding built into the maintenance schedule? To answer that question is yes, but there are other factors that may interfere with mowing, 
with weather being one of them and heavy rains, but we do have an expectation of what the mowing, mowing cycle will be. Uh, and it does vary from parks to ball fields. Uh, I'll defer to Commissioner Fulford Kavanaugh to answer more specifically, but yet the answer is yes, but there, it is in some cases weather dependent. And if we have all of our, our equipment that is operating so that we could actually execute the work. Then how come it's not mow, uh, some, some lawns are not mow for weeks? You know? Unless you know, some people, they complain. As, you know? as stated, I believe the expectation is about every two weeks. Uh, if there's heavy rainfall, uh, we're unable to cut it at that time. And so it does depend on the weather. It does depend on making sure we have the equipment that's operational. Uh, but the expectation is for at least the general park is to cut it about every two weeks. Ms. Councilman, as the commissioner said, our cycle is every two to two and a half weeks on all lawns. However, weather is the biggest impediment to that. I will just take you back, for example, you may recall, but it rained every single Wednesday in July this year. So we lost every Wednesday to mowing because you can't mow when it's raining or when the grass is wet. So you lose one of several days a week in a mowing cycle, it pushes the cycle back. Also, obviously, rain contributes to the growth of grass. So the two things are count, running counter to each other. But clearly, if there's ever sites in your individual districts where you feel they haven't been mown in an appropriate time, please reach out directly to the borough commissioner who has a, obviously direct connection to the staff, but the staff is on a constant mowing cycles around all the boroughs. Thank you, yeah. We are joined by Council Member Blandon. Yeah. So my, my next question is about um, my favorite subject, which is, which is bathrooms. <laughs> yeah, we all know bathrooms are important in your own house or in restaurants. So it's also very important in parks, especially like the population is aging. You know, if there's no problem, uh, bathroom, uh, senior citizens they won't stay too long in the bathroom. I mean, they won't stay long. To, to, they won't stay too long in the park because they worry about going to the bathroom. Right? So, so how many bathrooms are located in parks in total? We, have, we roughly have about 690 comfort stations uh, in our park system. 690. 690, almost 700 mm. comfort stations in our park system. And how often are they maintained and cleaned? Is it depending on the season and use? Uh, it's daily, and in some cases at our beaches, it's, it's, it's daily, and it could be several times during the day to make sure that the supplies are there and that they are clean. So you're correct, depending on uh, the location, but it is daily and it could be many times throughout the day. Yeah. Just add, Councilman, that um, all of those 690, 700 plus comfort stations are locked and unlocked every day. So when our staff goes there in the morning to unlock the comfort stations, they unlock the door, they turn on the lights, they check to make sure there's toilet paper and et cetera, that the um, comfort stations are in good shape. They're then generally checked to be cleaned at what, some point throughout the day, and then in the evening, we return to lock them up and there's another check done then. So what, what time do you lock those bathrooms? So during, the season, during our peak season, again, which is summer, we're committed to keeping our comfort stations open until 7 p.m. or later, seven days a week. Um, during the winter months, the comfort stations are closed more around 4.30, 5 o'clock. It gets lighter, excuse me, it gets darker much earlier, and our staff is on a single shift. So during the winter months, they're closed 4.35. During the summer months, they're closed 7 p.m. or later. So, so what happens when the bathrooms are locked? I mean, people need to use it. It is our practice and the safety concern that we do not keep our parks, oh, the, I'm sorry, comfort stations open. They're locked for security reasons and then are reopened again in the morning. So those comfort stations are not available to the public. And in most cases, they coincide with the closure of parks where you should not be in a park in the first place. Uh, but in terms, we have to work with our shifts. And 7 p.m., as was stated, uh, in peak season and then much earlier on the non-peak season. So how many bathrooms are closed for winterizing? Uh, uh, at what point uh, in the year do such bathrooms have their water shut off? No. 
So Councilman, we will get you the exact number, but it is a very small handful. It's a few dozen, maybe 20 plus or minus of the 690 that do not have uh, heat in them, so they have to be winterized. And winterized means that the functioning of them wraps down in November or so. By December 1st, they're generally winterized, and then they're brought back up to functioning in the spring. It all depends on when it starts to get warm, but it could be some point in March into mid-April but we'll get you the list of comfort stations that have to be winterized. So can, can you give us a list of the bathrooms that, are, that every year you have to close because of? Yes, yeah. we will get you that. Yeah. Uh, how many bathrooms are able to be open year round? So only those uh, uh, field bathrooms need to be winterized. They are open year round, except Correct. those ones. Correct. So it's 20, so that's roughly 6, 70 can stay open year round, 20 have to be closed to, for, to be winterized. Okay, uh, I want to ask um, Council, uh, Council Member Eric, do you want a question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, always good to see you. I think the last time I saw you, you were in bike shorts on the boardwalk in Rockaway, so. <laughs> I'm Can glad to see you were, you were making a weekend inspection of the conditions there. But, uh, yes, I was. And uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh, of course, is a frequent uh, visitor to the beach. Not, not in bike shorts, though, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, gosh. All right. I first want to commend, I, I don't know if he's here, Commissioner Dockett, the new Queens Commissioner. He, he does a terrific job. He's really hit the ground running. He's, met not only with me and my fellow elected officials in, in my neck of the woods in Queens, but with all of the civic and um, nonprofit leaders um, in the communities. So I, I wanted to say that uh, Dottie Lewandowski left some very sh big shoes to fill. She did a, a phenomenal job, but uh, Commissioner Dockett really has hit the ground running, and, uh, and I think he's doing a fine job, and I want to thank you for appointing him to that position because he's doing great. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about Rockaway and also Forest Park, if I can. Rockaway Beach, as you know, has seen a, a wonderful resurgence since Hurricane Sandy. So with the, with the um, ferry coming back, it's brought you know millions of additional visitors. But that requires more service and maintenance. And one of the uh, many complaints that I got this, this year uh, to my district office and to my Facebook account was pictures of these overflowing garbage uh, bins on the beach and on the boardwalk. And I know that halfway through the season, I think parks stepped it up and added additional uh, service. But, um, you know, how do you actually plan for that? Uh, what, what does that look like? And then how do you make change? How long does it take to make changes to a plan like that? Well, for one, first of all, I appreciate your comments. And it's always good to see you both be here or on the boardwalk. Uh, as you know, uh, some photographs are always taken at a snapshot in time, and I always tell them that we have dedicated crews that will go out there. If you go out there some hours later, it is gone. But it's that peak time when people take that snapshot, but we have crews out there that make sure before the day is up, the beach is clean. We have made adjustments. We've added additional staff out to Rockaway. We listen. We all know that the Rockaway community is not shy at all. And so we make sure we make the adjustments necessary. Uh, we have an administrator out there, a new administrator, and so we make sure we make those adjustments so that the park uh, maintains, the beach maintains clean. I've been out there many times. I have not seen what people were referring to, but certainly that is a heavily, heavily used beach. And on some of those very hot days, there is excess trash. We want to make sure through the way we approach collecting them, they're in a location where we're not disturbing and having gators going up and down the beach. But by the end of the day, by the next morning, those beaches are pristine and one, clean. one of the parks employees confidentially told us that there were five pieces of equipment that could be used for cleaning the beach, but that at any given point this season, there were four of them being repaired or serviced by DCAS and how long that takes. And so sometimes there were times throughout the summer that there was only one piece of equipment available to do the entire uh, you know, stretch of the, uh, the beach there. I thought that that was a bit silly. Why isn't Parks able to repair some of their equipment in-house? I don't. I always, as a rule of thumb, ask the people to speak to the administrator. Don't know if the park worker with a beach 5.5 miles that have to be taken care of 
may know all the details about what vehicles are in or out of operation, uh, but it's something that we make sure we have the proper vehicles to maintain. That sounds highly unusual that four to five vehicles be out of service, but it's something that we watch on a daily basis and we rectify it and we have ways of uh, backfilling vehicles if needed in those situations. So is, is Parks able to, on, on any, at any given point, able to uh, have a vehicle repaired and not have to wait three weeks for it to come back from DCAS, either do it in-house or, or go to a private mechanic shop and have it done? I mean, I, just, just for the sake of, you know, such a short beach season, it seems unusual to me that uh, certain pieces of equipment could be out of commission for almost a month. You know, we only have three months, uh, you know, four months out of the year to really make it work. Commissioner. So, Councilman, we, we monitor our uh, equipment and our vehicles on a daily basis on what's called the out-of-service report that's generated very early every morning. So we look at it and we determine which vehicles need to be prioritized for maintenance to get them back in service. Clearly, during the beach season, we always prioritize beach vehicles. We do have different agreements. DCAS maintains some of our vehicle types because they're very specialized. We maintain other vehicle types, and a third are maintained by contractor. So it completely depends on what vehicle you're speaking about, who's responsible to maintain it, and depends on what's wrong with that vehicle. Some of the beach vehicles, uh, the beach rakes they're called, are very specialized equipment that need specialized parts. And unfortunately, if it does go down, it may take longer to repair. It's, it's uh, oftentimes they're not simple repairs. Yeah, that may be the, the uh, I think there were five of them in the Rockaways. And at one point during the summer, there were four of them that were out of, out of service. So that, I, I believe that was the equipment. We had, we had a meeting with the other electeds uh, and some of the, uh, community people about a month and a half ago and that actually came up. Lastly, because I know there are other questions, I want to speed this up. Forest Park, I also uh, represent, my district goes from literally Park Lane South down to the Rockaways, it's quite large. But uh, Forest Park, you know, we have done, um, I think, a pretty good job of investing a lot of uh, local discretionary money and other capital monies, myself, Council Member Holden and the Borough President, in trying to restore not only the Pine Grove but other parts of Forest Park that have not seen investment in a very long time. What I'd like to see though is, is, an, is a commitment from the administration, a long-term commitment maybe in the five-year capital plan or something to show that uh, Forest Park, uh, which requires tremendous upkeep and, and obviously investment and maintenance, is, is a priority for the administration because so far the only projects that have been initiated and completed have been funded by the local or borough elected officials. We haven't quite seen the type of investment from the administration that we would like to see in, in Forest Park. Your invitation is noted. I'll go back to see exactly what those capital investments have been from the city side, but your recommendation is noted. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Thank you. So, Commissioner, I'll go back to some local uh, questions again. Uh, regarding jointly operated playgrounds, they call it JOPs. Right? What agency is responsible for their maintenance? Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Ku. The, the Parks Department is responsible for the maintenance of the jointly operated playgrounds. Okay. Uh, what is the inspection process for JOPs? Is it the same or similar to the park inspection process, PIP? Yes, and there are two components. There is the park inspection program. The JOPs are inspected at least twice a year as part of that program. Uh, but our park supervisors also inspect every property that they supervise on a monthly basis. So there are many more than just two inspections done for the JOPs and every other park in this system. So are uh, JOPs built or financed by private entities completely as accessible to the public? Uh, they're not financed by private entities. They're completely funded through the Parks Department's budget, and they are fully accessible to the public, except portions which are closed when school is in session to accommodate recess and other uses by school children. Because in the past, <coughs> Those playgrounds are open uh, all the time. <clears throat> so, but recently, uh, a lot of neighborhood complained that they cannot use the, those playgrounds. Once the school, if the school is open, they cannot use it. When the, once the school is closed, they cannot use it because of the, they, the, they don't have a budget for the custodian. 
in the school. Uh, Council, uh, I, I think you may be referring to the schoolyards to playgrounds program. Uh, those, those parks are managed exclusively by the Department of Education. Uh -huh. uh, we have no maintenance responsibility, inspection responsibility, or operational responsibility at those sites. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So uh, now I turn to uh, Council Member Verrabe for questions. Hello. Hey, guys. <laughs> Uh, I, I was going to start by complimenting the Manhattan Borough Commissioner, uh, Bill Castro, but he owes me an answer on the annual Tompkins Square Park Halloween Dog Parade. So uh, tell him to call me back. It's very important. It's an important tradition. So, um, <clears throat> and if anyone hasn't been there, please, please, please join us. It's super fun. So I want to just get right into, uh, I think that maintenance and operations uh, really does impact our local gardens. And I want to ask a couple questions about a recent license agreement uh, that I think you're currently negotiating with some of the local gardens. So $8 million of the $43 million that was allocated is to community gardens. How is that being spent? How is that being distributed? And when will, we use, when will we see community gardens in our district start to benefit from the funding? And if they have, what are some of those things? Uh, the division will hire uh, additional staff. This was 8.2 million to help engage our universe of 550 community gardens. The 350 of which that are on parks property but managed by groups licensed within the city will benefit from targeted infrastructure improvements uh, for the entire universe of the 550 of registered community gardens will benefit from tools, materials, equipment, as well as increased guidance and advisory services from the agency. So it'll be a combination of actual tools as well as resources. And so when you say resources, do you mean staff for some of these gardens? Like people will come through some of the garden spaces more frequently to help them out because for those who don't know, these gardens are independently run by countless volunteers who give tons of hours and have created incredible spaces that people come from all over the world to see. Right. Again, I'll underscore the additional staff provides guidance and advisory services, uh, and it may vary from garden to garden. What we do know is that we do have some of those tools and other hard resources, so to speak, that we could have, uh, such as soils, material, and other equipment that we could make available. But in terms of the additional staff is to offer that guidance and advisory services on an ad need basis. But again, it may vary from garden to garden. Okay, so they're more tangible than, I guess, uh, personnel. So the advisory services you bring up, the, the license agreement that has been in discussion, one of the major challenges for some of our local groups is the advance that you have to give for the events held in the gardens. And some of these events are well planned out and they're, they're amazing, they're backpack giveaways, they're barbecues, it's, it's Shakespeare, it's, it's really amazing stuff. Um, but some stuff is, is, is planned a little bit last minute. Press conferences, community gatherings, family events, they can get planned last minute and they could potentially be out of compliance with that sort of short-term planning under the new license regime. How are gardens supposed to operate independently with this very strict garden agreement and no other services with the additional funding besides advisory services? Uh, bringing up Assistant Commissioner Sam Biedemann, we knew the hearing was about maintenance and operations, but since there's a question about gardening, uh, Commissioner Biedemann is most up to date. I assume that he is deemed sworn in. If not, he can do that now. Uh, before. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee? I do, sir. Thank you. Hi, uh, so thank you for the question, Council Member. Uh, so the license agreement does ask the gardens, uh, the gardens submit their events four times a year, right? So there's a quarterly schedule for event submission. But uh, after conversation with uh, garden groups who did uh, raise some very reasonable objections to that, and uh, the, the, uh, the 
items that you brought up, you know, last minute press conferences, uh, last minute festivals, whatever, you know, not all of these gardens, we understand, can plan four months in advance, they're volunteer groups. We adjusted the handbook that uh, governs the rules and regulations around the gardens uh, to provide that uh, the Green Thumb staff can work with gardens in the time between those uh, quarterly check-in periods, so, and turn around event approvals as quickly as possible. From what I understand, the agreement would be somewhat ironclad and it would put these groups in a bind in terms of trying to host a gathering. Um, if they don't follow the, this new administrative kind of code, like to the letter, couldn't that potentially jeopardize their status as an open space? Uh, I, I don't want to get into hypotheticals about you know what might happen. I do want to underscore that we did adjust the uh, handbook to explicitly allow garden groups to submit their uh, to submit their proposals for events far closer to the date of the events, you know, um, not on a quarterly basis. I hear you. I, I don't like speaking in hypotheticals either, but I, I do find, uh, I guess, the newer version of what you originally proposed to be problematic, and I just urge you to stay in contact with the gardeners here to make sure that you're negotiating something that's fair, considering the history and the culture of what these spaces represent. We like to talk about how proud we are of these garden spaces, and without them being able to somewhat freestyle um, and respond to local happenings and what's going on and current issues, I think it kind of takes away from what's the spirit uh, of, these, of these gardens. And, and as you know, we've enjoyed a decades long relationship with our gardeners. Uh, we celebrate them. We enjoy them being there, of the service they offer. Uh, every few years we are up for renewing these licenses and new issues come up that we have to discuss. But your points are well taken. Uh, we have been in active negotiation for many, many months, uh, and this is something that we'll continue to do as we get to resolve some of these thorny issues that are there for a small percentage of the gardens. We still have a significant number who did sign, and we'll continue to work out some of the issues with the few who have not signed. Okay, I'll be sure to follow up. I just have a couple more questions. So we added, the council added $34 million in one shots in this year's budget, including additional maintenance workers. And in your opinion, so we can be helpful, uh, what are the top one shot items that parks would wanna see ideally baseline the next fiscal year and, and why? Well, that's a good question. That is a question I'll be prepared to discuss in more detail uh, in March when traditionally we have these conversations. Uh, but uh, as you know, it was uh, very beneficial in terms of the 43 million that was uh, given to parks this year, and we look forward to that conversa conversation to continue when we have the preliminary budget hearings in March. Okay, um, and that's my last two questions, Mr. Chair, if that's okay. One more? Okay, one more. I better, I better make it good. Wow, I have so many. Um, I guess I, I wanna ask, I'm gonna make it local. So Union Square Park, wonderful park, great place. We have a little bit of a trash issue there. There tends to be, it's, it's clearly a very busy park, it's legendary, all of these things. So when they go to pick up the trash, you have these push carts and they put them at the side of Union Square East. And when the trucks come to empty the, the push carts, um, there is, they park at the bike lane. So we have been talking to parks, and I know the Department of Transportation, you have to work together to find a solution for maybe the west side or the north side, but we haven't been able to get a timeline on when we can find a solution so that way we can get the trash out, keep the bike lane clear, and then keep it nice and clean. Um, so if you could just maybe get back to my office on that. And um, additionally, the last thing that I, I wanted to mention was Talking about this citywide conservancy that was mentioned in the report um, in terms of the Center for an Urban Future and how we could maybe work together on whether it's citywide or more nuanced to support the smaller parks to make sure there's equitable resources. So thank you. Thank you, yeah. Commissioner, uh, you mentioned that you have an app uh, to mobilize the maintenance crews to different uh, parks. Can you give us some details how to how, how you use the, the app system? Hmm. You want to know more information about how the app then works? How you, how you mobilize, how you assign people to different parks. Yeah. And how you make sure these workers 
when they go there, they did a good job. You know, how, the, how the supervisors know that they're doing a good job? Well, they're not moving off. Huh? So the app that I mentioned is called Daily Tasks. It's very descriptive. It tracks the daily tasks done that are associated with cleaning of parks. So there's two components of daily tasks. One is the component followed by, followed by the staff that are sent out on predetermined routes. And it's on a handheld device like this that we provide to staff. And they literally record everything they do in that park, when they show up, what they, what they did, when they leave, et cetera. Then there's a separate component of daily tasks, which is called the supervisor application of daily tasks. And the supervisors do the inspections referred to by Commissioner Kavanaugh and follow the routes to make sure that the work was done to an appropriate level. And all of that is recorded in as close to real time as possible on their mobile devices. What is the ratio of supervisor to workers? Uh, how many workers they are supervising for each supervisor? How many? Would it varies. We can, I, we can look into that and get you the range. It varies greatly depending on the time of year. Um, because as Commissioner uh, Silver mentioned earlier, during our peak season, we step up many folks into supervisor roles because again, we almost double the number of staff that we manage. So we'll get you that range. So if a, a constituent or anyone complains about a part not being clean, uh, what is the process? They call 211 or they call you guys? Well, Juan, I'm pleased to say it is rare that a park is not clean, but event that is not clean, they can uh, contact 311. Uh, or if I would say 311 would be the best way of doing it. Uh, if they are aware of who the, their borough commissioner is, they could always call the borough office, but 311 would be the best. My guess is by the time that call comes in, that problem has been abated because we clean the parks so many times during the week. Council Member Joyner to ask question. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. So good to see you again, Commissioner. Um, I was so happy and pleased with the last meeting that we recently had. I know that we have a few things to follow up on, and I know that we're going to get, we are going to continue this partnership of ours, but I can't help but mention since our meeting. I represent the largest park in New York City, 2,700 acres. We don't have the equipment necessary to maintain the largest park in New York City. We don't have the manpower. Although the grass does get cut, we have a problem with the edges that don't seem to follow simultaneously, and I know that's a lack of time um, and maintenance issues. But we had to hold the first ever, believe it or not, grass summit meeting in my office with the in actually assemblyman michael benedetto's office where we brought in state dot city dot sanitation and parks department to address some very fundamental conditions of pelham parkway to my surprise no one has cut the grass for years or was willing to admit to cutting the grass on Pelham Parkway, the median, and the sides of Pelham Parkway. This is the major thoroughfare leading into Pelham Bay Park, Orchard Beach, the first impression that our visitors get, where you yourself may have seen the pictures, it was more like a wheat field than parkland, where it was as tall as me, and that was months of trying to figure out who's going to be responsible. Before you answer that, pocket parks have, don't have a dedicated routine maintenance staff. And those are the green leaf pocket parks I'm referring to. The, uh, uh, what do you refer to them as? Uh, green, green streets? Green streets. No dedicated staff. Um, I don't see a steady funding stream for abandoned boats, for waterfront communities, and debris that washes up on our shorelines. And although Parks Department is the agency responsible for these properties, we know that there's 
agreements in place with other agencies that you've indicated you would be continuing with the commissioners at your next meeting. I hope to hear an update on that. But the abandoned boats that create a life and, and health safety issue to other boaters, as well as that have polluted our shorelines, it takes years to have the, the most minuscule investment made into removing those eyesores and potential safety issues. Your partnerships with friends and non-for-profits is great, but they cannot be police officers. We have a very active group that pursues illegal barbecuing and homeless encampments, and we haven't been brought up to date on the posting of when a park opens and when a park closes, or park land, I should say, in particular, Pelham Parkway, so we can better enforce the regulations. And the last point I want to bring up is we recognize there is a real shortfall in the budget that you have when it comes to capital and maintenance um, requests. Why would we put the jurisdiction of Hart Island into parks responsibility when you currently don't have the means necessary for maintenance and improvements, taking on such a large responsibility is one that I would love to hear how Parks is currently going to meet the needs of maintaining the largest public cemetery in the country. Thank you. Thank you for those questions, Council Member. There were quite a few. I'll try to take them in order and then ask uh, the Deputy Commissioners to respond. Uh, as you know, we are having conversations about those green assets that are maintained by multiple jurisdictions, and we will get back to you once we understand the resolution. In terms of green streets and our assets, anything that we're in charge of does get maintained. They're going to be by mobile crews. We will not have uh, uh, fixed crews uh, for greenways or green streets, but we do have mobile crews that are assigned to address them over a specific number, specific times. Some green streets, because they're traffic islands, we want to make sure they're safe for our maintenance crews to maintain them so that there's no fear of having any type of accident, but they are part of our maintenance operations per borough. Uh, the other question you had mentioned, um, uh, and that includes uh, the green streets. Um, in terms of the Hart Island, uh, that right now is a bill that is pending. Uh, that is something that the council will have to deliberate on. If it is ultimately it passes, uh, then this is something that there is a timeline that we will be asked to uh, take care of that facility. But that is now part of an active discussion and legislation that I believe is already moving forward. And so certainly we can have conversations with you about that, but that right now discussion has already uh, taken place. Um, I don't know if I missed any of the other questions, but I think I covered all the no abandoned boats. Uh, abandoned boats. Debris. Uh, let me refer that to you, uh, Councilmember. Uh, uh, since Hurricane Sandy, the city and the Parks Department have had contracts to remove abandoned boats and other vessels and d marine debris in general uh, from places all over the city. If there are particular places within your district where that occurs, let us know, and we will get those contracts to, to remove them. Are you going to commit to me? Because I have boats that have been out there for decades before Hurricane Sandy and after Hurricane Sandy, and they have not been removed, and you're on record. Okay, if, if they are on our properties, we will remove them. They're on waterways. You are responsible for removing? We are, we are responsible for some waterways, yes, and we take care of them. The Department of Citywide Administrative Services, who ministers the contract and who we work with very closely on that program, is responsible for more waterways than we are. Uh, give us the list, we'll take a look at it, and we'll let you know what we can do. Why do I have a funny feeling I'm gonna have to have a boat summit next to figure out who's responsible <laughs> for what? You know what the problem is? New Yorkers don't really care. They don't care if it's sanitation parks or if it's city DOT or state DOT. They want basics. Cut grass, it grows. You're supposed to have a program in place to get it cut. If there's a sunken boat or if there's debris that washes up on a shoreline, they don't care who's responsible. They expect someone to be doing that work. And when we get into this gray area about, well, I'm not sure if I'm responsible or they're responsible, 
it looks like government is failing. And it is failing them. These are basics. If there's a sunken boat out there, it should be on everyone's radar. You don't need me or the community to bring that to your attention. If there's overgrown grass, you don't need the elected officials or the community to bring it to your attention. There are multiple agencies responsible to oversee this. Which leads me to my last point. I am one of the few council districts that does not have the luxury of a pool. It's unfortunate that 170,000 residents do not have use of a public pool. I brought this up before. I've offered alternatives where we can use our existing waterways and have these new pools that are being looked into as a very viable and an expensive option. And before I turn over the microphone to you, I am very fond of our Borough Parks Commissioner, Iris Rodriguez. She does an excellent job. Thank you. Councilmember King, you have you the right to ask questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner and the wonderful team at Parks. Go Iris. We are Iris fans here. Um, I, my, my questions are very brief um, in regards to the maintenance of our parks. I'd like to know what kind of system that's in place that actually tracks when a call gets come, when a call comes in and how do we know that the job is finished and is there a timeline by the time a, a complaint or a request comes in that the system's in place so you have two weeks to handle this or one week to handle this because Councilman John, I mentioned it, and I know I have parks in my district that because of weather, bushes are six feet tall. We had a young lady that was stabbed and injured um, because of visibility because the trees were blocking the lights. So I did, I did share that because it was all on the news, but still um, hasn't been cut yet. So I'm asking you, what is that process that y'all have to make sure that this gets managed and taken care of? What timelines that you work with so you know someone's responding and being held accountable? If they haven't met a time, then why and why not? Um, my second question is goes to the fact of your workers, your seasonal workers. Um, summertime's a good high, 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 high spirit time, but come the winter when you do downsize, what do we do with these workers? Do we, can we find ways to utilize them because parks still need help in the winter time? You may not need as many workers, um, but how do we still maximize them in our system so not every season you're training a whole bunch of new workers every day um, to keep stability within your parks department? I understand from bodies that can be shortage at any given time of people getting appointed to certain parks because of personnel. Um, just like to know how you manage that. Um, and then the last question I have for you is, what maintenance challenges that you know that you have that we in the city council can help you out with? Thank you for those questions, uh, Councilmember King. Uh, to answer your first question, 311 is always uh, the best approach. Uh, that is tracked, and we will respond uh, on 311 about how that issue was addressed. Clearly people fax us, call us, there are a lot of methods. We prefer 311 because it is tracked and we were able to address it through that system. Uh, in some cases, what someone may see as a concern after going out and inspecting it, we may have a different perspective. That's always difficult to share, but we do look at the 311 calls coming in and we do have an obligation to respond back so that the person that's calling it in, whether it's by app or by call, gets a response. So all of those vary. If it's a different situation, we do ask for a high level of intervention. If some bad incident take, took place and there seems to be some visual obstacles, as you all know, the whole parks are borders. We have to provide more visibility to the parks, reducing fences, removing vegetation. That is a high priority, so that's something we'll certainly take a look at. In terms of the seasonal workers, uh, they sign on knowing it is for a season. The good news about retraining is many of them return again and again, whether they're retirees or they just are like working in parks on a seasonal basis. You heard the period can be quite some long. They're comfortable with that schedule, and so we're very blessed to have a lot of our seasonal workers return again and again, which minimizes the retraining of these employees. Uh, I did answer earlier, but in terms of our challenges, we, we really don't have any challenges per se on the operation and maintenance side. 
It's something that we embrace as part of our daily operation. Our staff takes great pride. Uh, I think the challenge coming in, I was somewhat frustrated when I found out that parks were open seven days a week, but we were only cl cleaning some parks only five days a week, and I felt that had to be rectified. So we were able to get infusion uh, baseline funding from the mayor in 20, FY 2017. Uh, and that was, now we're able to, for the top 100 hotspot parks where barbecuing and other things take place, they're now clean seven days a week for the first time. And so that was a challenge because I kept getting calls and photographs of overflowing garbage cans come Monday morning. And now staff is very grateful because they're not confronting that mess come Monday morning. They're able to intercept and take that trash out over the weekend. So as part of our operations, we don't see it as a challenge. We see it as something that is our privilege to keep these parks clean for New Yorkers and visitors. Thank you for your answers. Um, and thank you in advance again with your help with Haven Park and, and the pool. Thank you for that. We're excited about how that's, that finished product is gonna look like. So thank you again for all the work that you gentlemen do and ladies do to make sure our parks look great in the city of New York. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember King and Commissioner. Uh, I want to ask you a couple questions, and then we will turn to uh, council mem uh, other me council members again. Um, what is the role that the, the um, Park Inspection Program (PIP) uh, plays in determining what types of maintenance is needed in a particular park? The uh, the PIP program, the Parks Inspection Program has been around for almost 30 years, and it's an invaluable part of our operation. It's somewhat of an audit function, so it's outside of the maintenance and operations. They inspect do about 6,000 inspections every year, and almost every park property is, park is inspected about twice a year. It is instrumental in telling us what needs to get fixed. It's very detailed. We have overall condition, and then we have cleanliness. So we're able to go in and staff does not know when these inspectors are showing up. Uh, and then we meet once a month to analyze that data, just like the police have ComStat, is kind of park stat, mm -hmm. so to speak. And it lets uh, both the chief operating officer and the deputy commissioner, under, first deputy commissioner, understand where we need to make some adjustments. Uh, it, there could be a variety of reasons, but also gives us an indication of what capital improvements are all already needed, also needed. Uh, it tells us about some of the trends. We may see some districts trending more positive, some trending in a different direction, and we're able to intercede early to find out exactly what was going on. Is it the right crew? Is it weather? Is it the supervisor? So we can go in and give the support that is needed, or is it equipment uh, to that particular district? So it's instrumental and critical to our operation, so much so that it's part of the mayor's management report, and that's something we're very transparent about. We're very pleased with a 95 and 90 percent rating for condition and for overall uh, for cleanliness. So, does the department um, uh, reallocate or increase maintenance workers uh, if a part or grant does not meet the PIP uh, inspection criteria? It is possible. I'll let the commission, deputy commissioners respond. It is possible. We first try to see exactly what is going on. We have our chief of operations. We have our commissioner level to determine exactly what the issue is before we figure out how to make adjustment additional staff. So I'll let the commissioners respond, but it does vary. Okay. Yes, as Commissioner Silver said, we look at the data on almost a daily basis. So we, we won't adjust staff based upon one um, report, one PIP report. But if we start to see trends over a number of weeks or months of a district or a sector that's performing poorly in one function or another, within a borough, we can adjust staff to address the conditions to elevate the cleanliness and the overall condition at those sites. Right. So, so not on a case, not on a day-by-day -day basis, but over a trend basis, yes. So the good news is because we meet monthly, you do not see problems surfacing in parks on the maintenance side. We know right away, and we're able to intercede right away and not wait for several cycles to take place. Uh, are these reports available uh, online to, for the public to see? Yes. All of the PIP data is available um, through our website, through parks and then through the open data, NYC open data. Okay, thank you. Now uh, I turn to uh, Councilmember Cohen to ask questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair Koo. Uh, 
Well, good to see you, Commissioner. We actually, we spent a fair amount of time this summer. We did, uh, I think, a couple of groundbreaking, some ribbon cuttings. We had a good summer, so uh, it's good to see you back here at City Hall. Um, I, I have a bunch of questions that are sort of all over the map. Uh, a, a couple of years ago, I, we had a hearing on PEP uh, and the high turnover rate on PEP. Has there been any progress made on that front, uh, on PEP retention? There has been. Uh, we were able to work with the union to increase the number of hours per week, which increased the salary. Uh, and we've also did an employee survey uh, to find out some of the concerns. This was across the board with all agencies. We recognize re retention for PIP was an issue. A lot of them are moving on to NYPD and, and other you know, corrections because we're told we have some of the best and brightest of recruiting because of our standards of being a peace officer. Uh, but we have seen that stabilize a bit. I'm personally at all events doing my personal recognition, showing my appreciation, giving them all the support they need. We're doing a new training facility, so we're doing whatever we can to upgrade their experience because we care deeply about the work that they do. So we have seen those numbers stabilize. Do we still have some attrition? Yes. Many, after being with Parks, realize they have higher pay uh, in other uh, opportunities in the city of New York or elsewhere. Uh, but we're very pleased that we were able to <coughs> address some of the severe retention losses we're experiencing in the past. Uh, and, and on those lines, I was a little surprised to learn, I guess uh, PEP, PEP, PEP is not on the job 24 hours a day. There's not PEP, because uh, I think all of us have probably experienced a lot of times where there'll be, there'll be uh, a disturbance in a park, noise, uh, and it's, it, there's no, there, it's all the police department at that point. I don't know what hour PEP wraps up, but. Um, Correct, we have uh, the two shifts. Um, and there are some special occasions when they have certain events, but most of those events end around 10 o'clock, but they do have to stay, whether it's uh, New Year's Eve or some events in some of our larger parks. They do have to stay beyond 10 o'clock, but we do have primarily two shifts to do our coverage in New York City. I've been, I've been working closely with the 50th and, the, you know, in Van Cortlandt Park, it all falls into the jurisdiction of the 50th, but some, some of it is very far from any other place in the 50th. Uh, so working with the, with the 52nd precinct and the 50th to deal with, you know, where I'll have partying and barbecuing that goes well, you know, past midnight, and I, and I see on social media people who can't sleep and can't uh, enjoy their, uh, their home because of disturbances in the park. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about mowing, and I have to, you know, I gotta give credit where credit is due. Uh, this summer just passed was much better, but the summer before we really had challenges uh, all over the Bronx, is my understanding. Uh, and this summer was much better. Uh, so, but I, I think that it, it appears to me that the, equ the equipment levels are still like, there's not a lot of margin in the Parks Department with equipment. If a piece breaks, you really feel it. Uh, and I, and I, I think that we need to have a commitment to try to like, that there be maybe like a couple of backup mowers so that in addition to getting them repaired, that you also have another mower that the whole operation doesn't. Yes, please. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you, Councilman. First of all, for recognizing the improvement in the Bronx, and it's interesting. Uh, specifically, that improvement occurred because we replaced a lot of equipment in the Bronx between 2018 and 2019, both combining Bronx resources that uh, Commissioner Rodriguez Rosa made available and central resources that we had. So we are in the process now as we're wrapping down our mowing season. By the time we end, finish mowing by middle of October. We'll do a full diagnostic and debrief on all five boroughs. And then we've also, we've already identified some resources to purchase additional equipment. Um, we are trying to build redundancy into the system. We recently had a success in building redundancy into our forestry equipment, which was very important for responding to forestry issues. Now we're looking at building redundancy into turf maintenance. And I wonder, has, has the Parks Department given any thought to more creative uses of other ground cover? I mean, grass is, it's a pain to maintain, and why? And I don't know why we're so eager to cover everything in grass. If we could use ivies or other kind of plantings, maybe we could uh, reduce some of you know. It's because it I get a lot of complaints. We, you know, I know you get a lot of complaints right. when the grass uh, is not. I'm trimmed. sure we could all comment. There's some plant material that does attract rodents, so we have to be careful. Uh, it depends on the user experience. I mean, we have 30,000 acres. A lot of it, 10,000, is uh, natural area. Uh, it does impact the type of use. We explored synthetic turf. There's only so much we can do there. We do natural turf. There are options for ground covers, but even with that, maintaining it and how do you uh, uh, a 
allow the public to enjoy those areas varies. So it's, I'm sure all of us could weigh in and have a comment, but clearly having natural grass, uh, natural turf, uh, provides the most options for the public to use and mowing and edging seems to be the way you maintain as well as your seeding and aeration um, during some parts of the season. We also do um, regularly look at areas that we can take out of um, regular mowing regime and put into meadow grasses or other things that only require to be mowed twice a year. They're more environmentally sustainable and appropriate. In many ways, they support lots of species. Um, you know, there can be challenges with the fact that generally our park users expect this kind of appearance of a mown lawn when they come to a park. Um, so we always have to balance both use patterns, um, perception of what maintenance looks like to our park users, environmental, and then of course budget and resources. Uh, along those lines also, uh, I also a few years ago, we did a hearing on uh, the use of uh, herbicides in the parks. Um, I've been getting a lot of emails from people and, and there does seem to be, and, you know, I'm not a scientist, but there does seem to be a sort of more growing consensus about the dangers associated with Roundup. You know, I, I was convinced actually the last time we had this conversation uh, about, you know, the, the, the dangers imposed by invasive species versus uh, the benefits of uh, using herbicides, but I, I'm wondering if, it, if it's worth revisiting at some point that discussion as there does seem to be, again, a, a more of a consensus growing around, uh, I, I know Roundup is the commercial name, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Councilman, we're very aware of uh, all of the uh, concerns and debate around use of herbicides in general and glyphosate in particular. Uh, we have significantly reduced our use of glyphosate in parks where there is the likelihood of any kind of public contact. Uh, and we have limited it to places where uh, public contact is, is unlikely. I know, for example, our green streets, where weed growth can uh, interfere with visibility for drivers and pedestrians, and we don't want our employees to be repeatedly out in traffic maintaining those places. Uh, and in natural areas where we are closing places uh, for restoration purposes, and where we could not control invasives w by any other means. We couldn't, simply couldn't do it um, mechanically. As a result, I mean, we did see more weeds uh, captured in our park inspection program inspections, of course, of this year. We're looking at other alternatives that you know, might help us uh, prevent weed growth in, in those places uh, and, uh, and other you know, methods of removing them when, that, when it does occur. Uh, but we have significantly reduced uh, use of uh, specifically glyphosate, uh, and uh, you know, we, we are looking for alternatives. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, I don't know if this has anything to do with the parks or this is uh, OMB, or, uh, but up until this year, because uh, we talked about uh, friends groups, uh, we were able to, uh, through the City Parks Foundation, uh, issue very uh, sort of micro grants that were able to go to uh, friends of groups to help them support the programming, and we were not able to do that this year. I don't know what, if you know. All right, Matt's ready to. Um, um, yeah, Matt Drury, Director of Government Relations for uh, Parks Department. Um, it's my understanding that um, Central Council, I believe. An uh, internal decision. An internal decision was made to, to discourage what, what, what's termed as fiscal conduits uh, to third party organizations that can't be formally uh, incorporated. You know, they don't have a 501c3 number, that sort of thing. This, we should try to figure out a way to uh, to support those groups uh, because they were the small amounts of money that were, I think, really well used and very appreciated on the ground. So uh, we did lawn, we did that. Um, you know that we uh, uh, the Van Cortlandt pedestrian bridge is back on track. Uh, I'm not getting any more money for that bridge, so hopefully that will. Uh, uh, and you know, when there was a discussion about about pools. Uh, and uh, I would like to maybe have a discussion with you at some point about, uh, I think that there's an opportunity for greater utilization at the Van Cortland Park pool. It's, uh, it, it's a hidden gem. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be a hidden gem. It should be a, 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 a you know, out there kind of bling gem. So I'd like to work on something that we could do maybe to try to uh, increase the visibility of that pool. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so commissioners, uh, 
New York City has a big problem. Is uh, is always talk in the about uh, in the press. Uh, is the rap problem, you know. So what is the Parks Department doing about the um, rap problems in the parks? Uh, are you training some special people to address this, or you're hiring uh, outside exterminators to do the job? I will. Uh, First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh, I'll respond, but we are taking the matter very seriously. Uh, it varies from place to place. The mayor has also made this a top priority, and so we, working with the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene, uh, to identify the locations of these rat reservoirs or where they're a problem, and then there are different strategies we use to address them. But I'll let Commissioner uh, Kavanaugh go into more detail. Uh, as Commissioner Silver noted, uh, the Parks Department is part of the Neighborhood Rat Reduction Program led by Deputy Mayor Anglin, uh, the Health Department using 311 data and their own inspections have identified areas in the city that have higher than, uh, than uh, uh, acceptable levels of, of rodent activity. We identify the parks within those zones uh, and you know, through the, uh, the Mayor's uh, initiative, We've received additional staff for both cleaning, uh, for exterminators. We have our own exterminators who work for us full time. Uh, supplies and equipment to such as rodent resistant trash receptacles uh, and uh, other you know, equipment and material to help us uh, address the rodent problems. In the zones that have been targeted by the Department of Health, uh, we have reduced the uh, signs of rat activity by 50% so far. Uh, we, our goal is to reduce it by 70%, so we still have a way to go, but we've made significant progress in those areas by focusing on cleaning, uh, on reducing uh, 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 food sources, uh, eliminating harborage, what they call harborage, the uh, ability for rats to find shelter, uh, and, and to treat for rats on an aggressive schedule. So we're, we're doing a lot. There's a lot of rats in the city. Uh, we're continuing to be committed to it, uh, but we have made some really significant progress. Do you have like, special garbage cans uh, in, the, in the parks I mean, so that the uh, rats cannot go in to eat the food, the leftovers, or you just, just open cans? No, uh, in, in the parks, we have, a, we have quite a range of trash receptacles in the park system, unfortunately. Uh, but in the zones that we've targeted uh, to reduce the rat population, we have two principal types of receptacles. One is called a big belly. It's a solar powered compactor that is completely rat proof. A rat cannot get into it. Uh, they're very effective, but they are expensive. Uh, and then the sanitation department has developed a new design. It's, we call it the, the steel can. It's a, it's a tall steel receptacle. Uh, that is also very effective at preventing rats from getting into food sources. They're much less expensive than the big bellies, and we're using a lot of, the, a lot of them uh, in the parks that we've targeted for the rat reduction program. Do, do you use poisons uh, to kill rats? We use a range of products. Um, we have been uh, especially using uh, dry ice, which is technically not a poison, but it is a registered pesticide. Uh, it is effective and it does have the benefit of not creating what is known as a secondary kill. Uh, we still do use some rodenticides that have uh, uh, poison as part of their ingredients. We use them on a, on a limited basis and we don't use them in places where there are nesting hawks or other wildlife that might feed on the rodents mm -hmm. and thus uh, be poisoned in, t in turn. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember um, Bannon, you have questions? Thank you, Chair. Um, I was walking my dogs last night in the park and I got caught in a sprinkler, but I won't take that out on you personally. <laughs> um, even though Is we had this. Irrigation or it's a It's actually the 97th sprinkler. Street ramp, so I can't complain about it. Um, uh, so, something that um, Councilman Joe and I said, I mean, I sort of share his frustration, and we, I have a fantastic relationship with Marty Marr, um, the Brooklyn Parks Commissioner, but there's a definite frustration on the maintenance stuff in that so much of our jobs as council members, what we're dealing with city agencies has to be, unfortunately, reactive. Um, 
you know, and I think before nine o'clock every morning, I send Marty like 10 emails of stuff I've seen that needs to be addressed. Um, and I was looking at an old um, a report about back in the 70s during the height of the fiscal crisis that Parks had a staff of about a little over 11,500 um, to do exclusively maintenance and operations. What's the, the head count today? It varies. Uh, the numbers are from 3,000 to 5,500. It's, what is it? 3,000 to 5,500, depending on the time of year. Okay. So, we're, so that means that we had more than double the amount of staffers working on maintenance and operations back during the worst times in city history? Let me, since uh, I was not here at the time and Commissioner Kavanaugh was, maybe he could add some. <laughs> I was not. <laughs> For the record. All right, well. <laughs> I know it's white hair. <laughs> uh, I, I, you have more insight into, I. I Council Member, I, 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 I will say it, it's very difficult to compare, uh, you know, Numbers from today to, to numbers in the in the 70s. It is 45 well, but why, years I mean, ago. But, but, but but why? Why is it hard? Well, but, uh, only because you know the way the the way the city accounted for things is is different between the two areas. Okay. Let me, let me give you yeah. two examples. So the the eleven the eleven thousand five hundred I believe refers to what is known in budget jargon as full time equivalents, and that is all of both the seasonal staff and at the time uh, the the parks department had. Uh, benefited from, uh, and I'm not sure what the years were, but a federal program called CEDA, uh, which provided a lot of uh, staffers for the Parks Department. Okay. Now our full-time equivalent, I mean, yes, Commissioner Silva is absolutely right, uh, we have approximately 4,700 full-time employees in the Parks Department, uh, but in addition to that, we have roughly, on average, uh, 1,700 POP workers, these are the transitional workers uh, through the HRA program that, are, that work for the Parks Department. Uh, we have our seasonal staff that comes on in the summer, uh, and you know about 1,500 or so are de dedicated, actually more than that, I don't remember the number, 3,500 are dedicated to maintenance. So our, our full-time equivalent uh, is, is actually about 7,500 per year. Uh, so the, you know that gap is a lot different, and what makes up the gap between now and, and, the, four, and, the, and in the 1970s I, I'm not quite sure. I can't answer that. My suspicion it is it has to do with the the CETA employees that were assigned to the Parks Department at the time. Okay. Uh, so there, there there were lots of differences. Uh, and then you know the, the fact of the matter is is that compared to the 60s and 70s, uh, uh, you know, all not all, but uh, there's there's market efficiencies that have occurred since then in terms of equipment and and tools and things like that that are extremely different and. I can give you a couple of examples, but I don't want to bore everybody on that. Okay. I mean, it, I understand even you getting into the semantics. It still just seems like a huge difference. Um, I understand this. it's been the titles are changed and that kind of stuff. Um, but how, how does Parks currently do maintenance inspections? I mean, is it sort of, you know, the guy who collects the garbage... He goes out there and he collects the garbage. There's no one to call him up and say, hey, go check out this park today. It, it looks really bad. I think uh, as was stated, we have a separate unit, someone of an audit division that independently goes out and will inspect a park at least each one twice a year. So we do 6,000 inspections. In addition... But this is, I'm talking about like daily, daily da stuff. There is, yes. Well, I'll let Commissioner Folk, the answer is yes, there is daily. And I do want to emphasize, I know I often hear the numbers, the bottom line is that we have now become a lot smarter through technology and having the proper routes and crew size that our numbers are 95 and 90 percent. And so we've learned over time, as what Commissioner Kavanaugh is saying, is approaching our part making this very different than in the past. When you had 11,000, you just deployed them. And now there are smarter ways we do our work, but now coming up with this routing software, we've now optimized our routes. We've optimized our crew size at what makes the most sense. For us, it's about a crew chief with a crew of four. I'm sure before they probably had 15 going out to clean a park. So we've learned a lot over time, and so we're very efficient. Uh, and if you look at the numbers of the mayor's report on keeping our parks clean. Uh, I'll refer now to Commissioner uh, Folk to go more detail about how those daily inspections take place. So on a daily basis, our staff is um, deployed based upon predetermined routes. 
They're managed by a supervisor. The supervisor independently follows the crews and makes sure the work is done. And then the supervisor, so that's on a daily basis. On a monthly basis, the supervisors independently visit every site within their geographic areas of responsibility and do an independent audit or assessment of those sites. That will look more towards structural issues, like at playgrounds and drinking fountains and things like that. And then on top of that, we have the semi-independent system that Commissioner Silver spoke about, the Parks Inspection Program that does 6,000 audits a year. But on a daily basis, every site that our staff visits is followed up by a crew chief or a supervisor to make sure the work that they were assigned to do is done. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think th there's, a, there's a lack of efficiency, at least on our end, just because we have to work so closely with the local staff, and they're very responsive. I, I, you know, they're fantastic, but the fact that that there's an overflowing garbage can or, you know, there was a mess left in a park over a weekend. The fact that we have to notify the parks folks who will then right away go and address it, there's a, there's a disconnect there. So there may be, we may have found some, you know, ways to increase in efficiency as far as staffing numbers and stuff. But as far as being proactive versus being reactive, there, there seems to be still a, a considerable Delta, and, I, and, and honestly, it's outrageous how little this administration fund gives money to the Parks Department. I think it's insane. I mean, I think if you ask any of my colleagues, um, this is a huge issue, you know, and, and we understand the constraints. I mean, obviously, you can't admit it, but we understand the constraints that you're under, um, which is why we fought so hard to get that additional $43 million this year. But I know it's just a drop in the bucket. Um, and, but with the amount of complaints and concerns I hear from, from my colleagues and, and, um, and how much of it re, you know, um, revolves around parks and parks maintenance, I wish the administration would prioritize giving the parks the money that they deserve to, to get this done the right way. So I appreciate the work that you guys do with the meager tools that you've been given um, and we want to be partners you know we don't want to be adversaries we want to be partners to try to to try to fill this close this gap because it ultimately benefits everybody so uh, but, well certainly we encourage more conversations I'll speak to Commissioner Marr about some of the concerns you raised since we do have these monthly meetings just by way of an example you probably know I went out to Al's head and I was there when a worker actually with a cart was loading up some of the trash and I didn't find not one piece of garbage in that park, but she said, if you were here this morning, she said the day before, it is a place where she said, whether it's quinceaneras, whatever it is, there are lots and lots of parties. They don't just bring regular trash, but whatever gifts and boxes, they're just overflowing. But when I got there, that was Sunday morning, the park was spotless and she was lifting some of the bags. So it could be timing, but I'm certainly open to uh, to figure out exactly what is happening in your district. That's something we can go back to address. But our expectation is that the staff likes to have those parks clean. It's something they're committed to doing. But if there's a problem somewhere, we certainly want to figure out what it is so we can make that adjustment. And Councilman, I'd just like to address that um, certainly some element of our work will always be reactive. And certainly appreciate your kind words about Brooklyn staff being reactive. But the basis of our operations is a proactive basis. We pre-plan routes. We determine the right level of staffing. And I suspect that the conditions that you see, and you may, con you may notify Commissioner Marr about it, 8 o'clock in the morning at a certain overflowing trash can at a playground, a mobile crew is about to hit that site at 10.30 in the morning and take care of the situation. So that situation's not going to last for more than a few hours um, because, again, the vast majority of sites are covered on mobile crews. I, I, obviously, no, no one ever calls their council person to say, I want to send you a photo of a perfectly clean garbage can. Um, us, too. They don't do that to us, yeah. either. So, no, I get it. It's just, it's just you know, people people's heads explode when they see the garbage can overflowing, then after it's fixed, they're on to the next thing. So, um, but I appreciate it. Thank you. So that concludes the uh, administration uh, testimony. We will now go into public participation. Uh, we'll call four persons at a time. Uh, the first panel will be Lynn Kelly, New Yorkers for Parks, Adriana Espinosa, 
New York lead for conservative uh, voters, Hunter Armstrong, Natural Areas uh, Conservancies, and Corey Povos, Prospect Park Alliance. But before we start, uh, I want to uh, take a, a five minute break uh, so for people can go to bathrooms or to stretch. Uh, it's not good to sit down for too long. No. Five minutes. Uh, can uh, Sergeant Arms uh, get a pause for five minutes?
So, Sergeant Arms, are you ready? So, uh, we will start the public participation. The first panel is already here. Uh, you can identify yourself and, and you may begin. Identify yourself first. Hello, uh, I'm Lynn Kelly and I'm the Executive Director of New Yorkers for Parks. Um, before we begin, I want to just take a moment to thank the council, in particular our speaker, uh, for reconstituting this committee. I want to welcome Council Member Koo, and I want to acknowledge that finally the Parks Committee reflects 50% of the users of parks and over 70% of the management of parks. And I welcome Councilwoman Rivera and Adams in that regard, so thank you. Um, New Yorkers for Parks is a founding member of the Playfair Coalition. You're familiar with us. Many of our coalition members are here today to speak. Thank you for staying and listening to the public testimony. Um, I'm going to breeze through some of this. You heard today how this money is being allocated from the Parks Department in terms of the new uh, funding. It's great that Parks has jumped in so quickly to be able to move on this money. I want to note some concerns. One, we didn't hear where these positions are going to be allocated. Distributions by borough, by parks, what's the process for that? How is that being determined? And two, uh, we understand that it is harder to hire certain positions, certainly gardeners and PEP officers, but the clock is ticking. And if we don't fulfill those PEP officer positions quickly, we will lose the opportunity. And I want to point that out. Um, lastly, on the community gardens, I also want to mention that uh, there's a lot of money on the table, which we're happy is going to be distributed to the community gardens throughout the city. We understand there are open issues with the license agreement. Uh, as a advocate for community gardens, we do not want the issues with the license agreement to be connected or tied or held up in any way as it relates to the distribution of the funding. We're also working under the clock of Mother Nature. These gardeners need their tools. They need to be able to get into their gardens. Um, we are in support of a transparent process as it relates to the allocation of the $43 million and continued uh, reporting measures. We will be certainly keeping an eye on that and encourage the coalition to do so. And I, rather than me continue to give testimony, I think it's really important to say that we feel We've, we're beginning to scratch the surface. The Playfair Coalition is delighted at what the council did and the administration, and particularly the baselining. But that's what's key. Like, these one shots are great, but if we don't baseline them, we're going to lose the opportunity. And uh, many of the coalition members, where I want to point out, our coalition started last year around this time. There was barely 60 members. We're now close to 160 member uh, in this coalition citywide. And I uh, look forward to hearing from my colleagues today. Thank you. Thank you. Since we have a lot of people uh, participating, so the time limit is three minutes, not more than three minutes. And less is better because we have a lot of people no who want to speak. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Adriana Espinosa. I'm the New York City Program Director at the New York League of Conservation Voters. I'd like to thank Chair Koo for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, our city is staring down a crisis of existential importance, and it's incumbent upon our elected leaders to invest our tax dollars in climate action and climate solutions. New York City's Department of Parks and Recreation plays a critical role in that fight, and that's why we, join, we are proud to join New Yorkers for Parks and DC 37 as founding members of the Playfair for Parks campaign. Earlier this year, our, co our coalition helped to secure a landmark $43 million increase for the New York City Parks uh, and Green Spaces. Um, the budget, this budget will begin to provide New York City Parks with the care that they need to remain healthy in our changing climate. Uh, I echo Lynn's in thanking the speaker for his support on the campaign, as well as the city council and Mayor de Blasio. Uh, it's critical that we continue to support the city's environment by fighting for green spaces citywide. Well-maintained parks are a vital part of New York's urban environment. Uh, New York City Parks, um, echoing what Councilmember Brandon said earlier, have done a commendable job maintaining our parks for years given their historically underfunded budget. And we look forward to highlighting the improvements that come out of the Playfair play victory and following the, that, uh, the implementation process from the budget. Um, 
parks and, and other green spaces are one of the city's most valuable environmental assets. They are a major so source of the city's urban canopy with over 2.6 million street and park trees. This canopy mitigates climate change, provides clean air and habitats for native wildlife, and contributes to the well-being of New Yorkers and our economy. They remove 1,300 tons of pollutants from the atmosphere, store 1 million tons of carbon per year. They help to mitigate urban heat island effect and can lower temperatures. They also contribute to resiliency by capturing almost 2 billion gallons of stormwater runoff. Based on these benefits, we can all agree that this is critical infrastructure. And, and however, these green benefits cannot be realized without parks employees who work tirelessly to ensure the health of these spaces. Our trees cannot achieve a fraction of the environmental benefits that I just outlined until they reach maturity. And that's why park ma maintenance workers, gardeners, pruners, horticulturalists, and foresters are all critical green jobs. And despite the laudable budget increase in fiscal year 20, uh, we know that there still are needs to be met overall for maintenance and operations in city parks. Uh, every staff line is critical, and we're concerned about the long-term security of some of the green jobs implemented this fiscal year. And in order to make a long-term impact on our parks, those positions should be baselined. Additionally, there were several critical Playfair acts that were ultimately not included in this year's budget. Uh, funding for the implementation of zone management strategy and maintenance across some of our largest parks and resources to allow fixed post permanent staff uh, would both go a long way to ensuring well-maintained parks. There's also a, an ask for implementing, um, a capital ask for implementing the forest management framework that was unmet. And um, in fiscal year 21, it's critical that the city do more to ensure that the 25-year roadmap for maintaining forests is fully funded. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, next, yeah. My name is Hunter Armstrong. I'm speaking on behalf of the Natural Areas Conservancy. Thank you, Chair Ku, for the opportunity to speak today. The Natural Areas Conservancy is a nonprofit organization that was formed in 2012 with the goal of increasing the capacity of NYC Parks and its partners to restore and manage the 10,000 acres of forests, grasslands, and wetlands under the agency's jurisdiction. To achieve our goal of bringing all 7,300 acres of city forest under active management, we worked in partnership with NYC Parks to develop and release the forest management framework for New York City in spring 2018. This plan includes a comprehensive look at the condition of our city's natural forests, one quarter of the entire NYC park system, and it outlines the investment needed to manage them over the next 25 years and to improve public access through a citywide trail system. In fiscal year 2020, forest management received one year of additional $4 million. We are grateful for this one-year investment by New York City Council and for the advocacy efforts of the Playfair Coalition. I'm here today to provide an update on this investment and to add, ask New York City Council to include increased funding for forest management in the FY 2021 budget and in future years. While New York City Parks is making progress this year, you cannot change the condition of our publicly owned natural forests in one year, and we need additional funding in future years to see success. As we all know, nature works on a different time frame. Over the past decade, ten, tens of millions of capital dollars have been invested in our forests. In order to ensure that this investment and future investments live up to their potential to provide our city with high quality access to nature, cool our city, clean our water, and support wildlife, they must be maintained. Sustained investment for ongoing management is important for the following reasons. First, natu NYC's natural area forests are at a tipping point. They are surprisingly healthy right now, but they need sustain sustained investment or they risk losing biodiversity. In the next 25 years, we will be living in a hotter and drier city with higher sea levels. New York City's forests are critical to mitigating the effects of climate change, including extreme heat, capturing stormwater to reduce flooding, and absorbing greenhouse gases. Extreme heat kills more people in the United States than hurricane, hurricanes, flooding, and storms combined. Our city's forests should be part of the city's climate solution. Third, developing a citywide trail system will allow people, many in low and moderate income neighborhoods, new forms of recreation and opportunities for well-being. 
the $4 million one-shot expense funding for NYC Parks this year by New York City Council is addressing these challenges. This is what NYC Parks and Partners are working, this is what NYC Parks, Parks and Partners are working to achieve by June 2020. 2,000 acres of forests improved, 15,000 trees and shrubs planted, 40 miles of trail improvements, 3,500 volunteers engaged. There's more detail in my written testimony. We urge the Parks Committee to support long-term and appropriate funding for New York City forests, an invaluable part of our city's infrastructure. Thank you. Greetings, Chair Kuhl and other members of this committee. My name is Corey Provost, and I serve as the Director of Government and Community Affairs for Prospect Park Alliance. It's my honor today to provide this testimony on behalf of our President, Sue Donahue. Uh, over the past 30 years, the Prospect Park Alliance has played a pivotal role in restoring the park to its original glory. During this time, we have worked closely with local elected officials, the Parks Department, and our surrounding communities to identify, prioritize, design, and complete approximately 50 restoration projects. Over close to 120 acres of, park, of the park and 5,100 linear feet of our water course, totaling over $200 million of investment into the park. In particular, Majority Leader Lori Cumbro and Council Members Lander, Eugene, and Levin have been instrumental in helping secure broad support for all of our projects. Brooklyn is booming. In almost every corner of our borough, we are seeing new housing and the neighborhoods surrounding the park are bustling now more than ever. We now estimate that a park receives some 10 million visits each year, and weekly we see thousands of people engaging in our many public programs, participating in a number of recreational activities, or simply gathering with family and friends to enjoy a picnic. All these activities have an impact on our park, from increased wear and tear on our lawns and our ball fields, to trash and litter that must be removed from the park. Keeping up with maintenance is paramount for Prospect Park Alliance, and we know that the feeling is the same at any other park in this city. Parks are not only vital green infrastructure, but critical to the, equality, to the quality of life for all New Yorkers. This is why we added our voice, and we thank the City Council for adding the $43 million for this past fiscal year. However, we know New York City and its millions of park users would be best served with a fully funded parks department that could secure stable green jobs, provide funding for New York City's forest and natural areas, key components in the battle we face from a changing climate, ensure that parks across the city have full-time dedicated staff, create a comprehensive zone management system, and address the aging infrastructure conditions that add to the maintenance concerns and inhibit park use. Prospect Park Alliance and the City of New York have had a tremendously uh, beneficial, mutually beneficial relationship, and we look forward for years in advance to, for years to come. Thank you. Thank you all for your participation. The next panel will be Roseanne Delgado, friends of uh, Pelham Parkway. Um, Aziz Dikan uh, from the NYL Community Gardens. Uh, Roland Chatway from Kisena Corridor Park Conservancy. And Dorothy Wu from Kisena Corridor, Corridor Park Conservancy. PowerPoint, Are you, Rosanne, are you ready? So you want to start from the other ones? Uh, from the right side, uh, Dorothy, which is the chart. You want to start first? Okay. All right. Uh
Parks Committee. Oh, Councilman Koo and all the members of the Parks Committee, thank you for sharing your time with us. Uh, I'm Chuck Wade, I'm the uh, president of the Casino Corridor Park Conservancy. Uh, this conservancy was made for the 101 acre tract of land that lies between Main Street, Flushing, and Casino Boulevard. It is an undeveloped area and is perhaps the newest park being developed in the whole city of New York. We have uh, been working since uh, 2006 uh, to develop the Casino Corridor Park and so far have accomplished. Uh, we, we had the, uh, the, the <coughs> we, we had the um, uh, Evergreen Community Garden, uh, which is the largest uh, uh, community garden in New York City with over 300 plots. We have the, uh, we have planted from seven to 10,000 trees in the Corridor Park, uh, and that was done uh, during the administration of uh, Mayor Bloomberg, and, uh, and we have now a need for having those trees pruned and uh, weed trees such as mulberry and invasive species like uh, cottonwood to be uh, thinned out so that those hardwood trees can develop in the park. We work with uh, Councilman Koo and uh, with uh, Melinda Katz, our borough president, uh, to to uh, incorporate and, and develop a meditation garden for the borough of Queens. This is adjacent to New York Hospital uh, Presbyterian Queens, and we saw a need for the patients there in the oncology center and also for the employees of the hospital to have a place where they could come and rest. Also, people who are visiting uh, patients and uh, people of the area uh, would find that this meditation garden is a place for solace and comfort during uh, times of stress and need that they may have. We're happy to say, uh, Councilman Koo, that the uh, garden is now under construction. We have been told that, and that we hope to have the dedication in 2020. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah. Okay. Now I'll go to uh, Asi or I'll go to Dorothy. Okay. So Dorothy Wu from the Casino Corridor Park Conservancy in Flushing, Queens. Uh, just to continue what our president has been stated, I would like to thank uh, our councilman hiring three security officers serving the Casino Park and the Corridor Park in 2019, 2018, and the Mayor de Blasio for fully funding the lights installed throughout the car park and the new state-of-the-art uh, state Silent Spring Playground, which was open in April. In spite of those uh, construction improvements, they are still long overdue and developed area that needs to be cared for and uh, maintained. A list of proposals is as following. Uh, first is uh, pruning trees. Those young trees planted during mini tree initiative for many that survived now need pruning and space to grow into woods. Um, second, uh, building a park border and uh, paving the missing sidewalks. The, the area of concern is along the corridor park between 146 playground and the future meditation garden. A study described this place as a poor quality landfill covering a depth of 10 to 20 feet. 
a hand, now a high fence separated the parkland from the street for more than 40 years. Third is making ex, uh, Casino Way accessible for safe passage. This unpaved path connecting Casino Boulevard and the Main Street will provide a safe mobility option for children, elderly, and cyclists. For adding lights for pathway, uh, the proposed path, which would connect Colden Street and 56 Road, would encourage a great frequency and the participation in parks activities. Fifth, uh, providing map for paths and the nearest point of interest. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Hello, Chair Ku. Uh, thank you for your patience. Unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, difficulties, I don't think the photos are available for you to view. But I'll go through the, a list of photos that I was per, uh, planning to uh, show to you. One is a photo that all these photos were taken this month in less than 26 days. The first photo taken on September 2nd. We forgot, you have to say your name first. Yeah, and then oh, you start. so sorry. Yeah. Uh, my name is Roxanne Delgado on behalf of Friends of Pelham Parkway. Yeah. And, um, it doesn't show, let's see. Thank you. Well, Mr. Aziz, why don't you start first? Sorry about Please that, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, just say your name and start, yeah. My name is Aziz Day Khan. I'm the executive director of the New York City Community Garden Coalition. I thank you, uh, uh, Councilman Ku, for your support uh, for community gardens and all the members of this committee who support community gardens. As you've heard from Commissioner Silver, there are 550 community gardens in New York City. There's probably more than that because there's some land trusts and, and privately owned spaces. Uh, Commissioner Silver talks about climate change affecting some of the work that they do in the Parks Department. I want to make clear that uh, we believe that parks, open spaces, community gardens are all climate mitigators and make the city more resilient, uh, more sustainable, and the air is cleaner. And we support any efforts that they make to continue those uh, policies that make this happen. I also want to talk about um, something that um, uh, committee woman uh, Rivera brought up about funding for community gardens. As many of you know, uh, there's a license issue that we're still trying to resolve, and we have some concerns about the maybe 100 plus gardens that have not signed the license and how they're going to be treated and whether they will be getting resources as we continue to negotiate with the city and with uh, the Parks Department to resolve some of the uh, outstanding issues. One of those outstanding issues actually has to do with maintenance. And um, I find it kind of, I want to say bizarre, but it's not really bizarre. I find it a little disturbing that um, community gardeners who are volunteers and who are stewards of the land of New York City are required to shovel sidewalks uh, during snowstorms. And if they don't complete that task, they get, they get violations that could lead to termination of their license. Um, it would seem to me that people, that the city should be responsible for, for shoveling their own sidewalks and not put it onto the community gardeners, who especially in the winter are not always around. Uh, my wife, who's about my age, just was diagnosed with coronary artery disease. It's a, it's a ticking time bomb that she had no idea she had. If she were to go out in the winter and start shoveling sidewalks and has a heart attack and falls down and dies, who's responsible for that? So we've offered a, a solution to that by, by asking the city, with the $43 million extra dollars that Parks has, to, to purchase a liability insurance policy that comes out to just under $200 uh, per garden. And that will, that will give every gardener the ability to continue to be volunteers without having this liability issue hanging over them. And so I strongly urge this committee to continue to pers help us pursue those, that, uh, that liability issue as one of the re resolutions that can happen with this license. Um, the last thing I want to say is that 
Um, there's been a lot of talk also about who's responsible for keeping these gardens and how we get resources. I want to make it really clear, community gardens don't get one single dollar from Green Thumb to continue to operate these gardens. The money comes out of our pockets. Um, we buy equipment, we buy soil. There's a lot of materials that we get and uh, we're being asked by the Parks Department under this license to be audited, which means that personal checking accounts can be audited um, uh, to find where the money goes. This is our personal money. If it were green thumb money, we would say fine. Um, so that's another issue that we would like to bring up. I know my time is up. I thank this, I thank this committee very much for your continuing support. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Roxanne Delgado on behalf of Friends of Pelham Parkway. All these photos the Chair was taken on the month of September. This first one was taken on the second, showing a group of uh, family barbecuing right next to a tree, illegal barbecuing. Oh, now let me see if I can go to the next photo. Okay. It's all right, sorry. Right here with that. Right there. Okay, it just has to go back, sorry. It, it just fro it just froze when I clicked on it, but I'll do it again. Otherwise, I'll just go to a testimony. Okay, so I'm ready. This is people on September 9th. They dumped trash near the tree, as you can see. That's awful. That's the problem with the, uh, the people tend to be the problem. Then we had over a quarter of a ton of illegal dumping on the parkway on September 9th, Chair. Quarter of a ton, that's almost 500 pounds. Then we had, uh, it took two crews to clean up that mess. On September um, 19, there's another mess left behind by uh, park goers. Uh, again, on September 18 and 22nd, we had a, people dump household trash. One person dumped seven bags of household trash onto the trash can, and she even left her telephone bill. This was the second day she left two additional bags of household trash, including medication that had pain patches, which was dangerous for pets and children. Then we, she left her phone number bill. This is why we have so much trash in the parkway. Even when they do daily pickups, with the household trash and with the illegal dumping and with the large gathering, we could accumulate almost seven, eight bags of trash in just one area in less than two days, Chair. Again, in this other corner on Bronxville and Palm Parkway North, again, almost nine full bags of trash because of the illegal dumping, household trash, and also uh, large gatherings. We just recently had, uh, two days ago, someone crashed, someone drove through the parkway and knocked out, left debris, glass, metal, metal parts, as well as destroy a park bench. <laughs> Again, this is why a lot of park and maintenance is more than just picking up trash. This is addressing, this has just happened in less than 26 days, Chair. Can you imagine all year long what the things we have to deal with in the parkway? They left treadmill marks on, on the grass. So even though the parks can do more with less, they cannot do the maintenance of the park that's required. It's not even adequate. It's no, and they do work hard, and they do their best, but it, there's not enough manpower to address the way parks is being used today. Not only do we have more park people, but they use parks differently, and plus some people don't respect the parks. As you can see, all the trash and the illegal dumping and people driving through the parkway. And I, ju I just like to say that also regarding grass, that's one issue we don't have in the parkway. They cut grass constantly, which is my main complaint because when they cut the grass, we have less insects for the birds. And actually the parkway is not a park, it's a parkway. We need grass because we're surrounded with concrete. We need the grass not only for the birds, but for kids to walk on grass. Thank you for your time, Chair. I appreciate it. Can, can you provide an electronic copy to our staff? I'm sorry, what? Yeah, yeah you got it. Right. Thank you. Uh, the next panel will be Martha Lopez Gil Gilpin from Astoria Park Alliance, Joe uh, Pulo Pulio uh, from uh, Local 983, DC 37, and Daniel Clay, President of Local 1507, DC 37. <coughs> Yeah, please identify yourself and you make it start. Yeah. Yeah.
Good afternoon. My name is Joe Puglio. I am president of Local 983. I represent the urban park rangers, the PEP officers, the associate park service workers, and all of the city seasonal aides and parks. In total, I represent approximately 1,700 park employees. So whatever the number is, 1,700 of those people uh, belong to our local. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking you uh, and the new, in, in, new people on the uh, committee. Um, I thank you again for the 80 PEP officers and the 50 Rangers. The problem we have is that this is not baseline money. And the requirements are high for these people. They need a two-year college degree in order to even be considered. They have to go through a background check. It takes approximately three months of training before they're actually set foot in a park. And that doesn't include the interview process. So by the time they actually hire one of these PEP officers, their time under this budget is very limited. And who wants the job to go through all that just to be told they're only guaranteed a year? You know, it's, it's, it's difficult to get these people. It's difficult to get the qualified people to do the job. And I know the intentions were great for everyone to get these people, and, and we really appreciate it. But I'm afraid that we're not going to, you know, meet, meet the task. We are already undernumbered. As we all know, there's 30,000 acres of parkland. Parks is the biggest landowner, you know, uh, for, for city land. We need to get more PEP officers, you know, and we need to keep them on a continuous basis. It's unfortunate the ones that are there are leaving. A lot of them go to NYPD. Why? Because of their salary. They make approximately half of what New York City police officers make. I know they complain all the time, but could you imagine them? They make half of what they make uh, on average. So you can see the dilemma that, that, that we're facing. <coughs> We need more full-time jobs. Our city seasonal aides do a great job, but they can't do the job, you know, uh, when, when it's most needed. We need them for the winter. We need them for the fall. We just don't need them for the spring. And these, these are real people. These real people need to earn real income. You know, it, it, these people take on these jobs for one or two months, three months, but they also have family themselves. Uh, again. I thank you all. I thank you for staying so late, and um, I hope that you know we'll have this this money baseline. Thank you. Thank you. Next, yeah. Thanks. Um, hi there. I'm Daniel Clay. I've been a New York City gardener for almost 15 years now, really close to 15 years now, and I've been the president of the local for just about a year now. And uh, I, I'd first like to thank you and everybody so much for everything you've done to help take care of my people and baseline the, the, the 50 gardeners and the, the CPWs as well, too. It's, it's such great. I love giving people the great news, and they're so appreciative. And um, the next thing I'd like to say is I, I can't wait to see the results next year after everybody's hired and the, the new one-shots and everything, and I, 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 I'm really excited. Such an exciting time, ex exciting time to be a gardener. And I can personally promise you that you will see results, especially if we could do the same thing next year and baseline all these one shots and do right by them. Thank you. My name Thank is you. Martha Lopez Gilpin. Um, I'm from Astoria Park Alliance. And these two gentlemen sitting on my left have just, um, just kind of touched on something that's crucial as I listen to this testimony today. We need to empower our workers, our park workers. They are at the forefront of the sustainability and environmental issues that we are facing in this city. We should empower them and make this a proud, strong union a workplace for these people. When we started volunteering in our park, we had to put volunteer on the back of our shirts because people would berate us and scream at us that the park workers weren't doing this and that. 
and it was it was very demeaning. And and I um, we have close contact with a lot of our park workers and our our as many officers and our gardeners. And these people work very hard and take a great deal of pride in what they do. This should be a very viable and prideful source of, of employment and, and um, sustainability in New York City. These green jobs mean more than just jobs. These people are actually bringing their skill and their heart to the parks. And so we need to do a whole other new park initiative in terms of workers and users. Users have to step up and be responsible. In, where I come from in Santa Fe, New Mexico, if you are in a park and you bring trash, you, need, you bring a garbage bag with you. That should be a requirement of everything that's permitted in parks. We need to pack it out. We are responsible. This is public land. It's, it's free land to use. It's not free land to abuse. And I think that um, along with all the great works that um, New Yorkers for Parks has done, another great initiative that could happen is pride for our workers and pride for our users and responsibility for our users. We need to reimagine how we look at parks and we need to build a, a sustainable message and outreach for people that use parks, and that really is all of us. Um, so I, was, I told myself I wasn't going to say anything today, but I am, and, and um, so, so thank you and bless you to our parks workers who work so hard, and all our volunteers, and our parks users who get so much out of our parks. We see so many people who want to make it better. Let's help them make it better. Let's empower everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from from Mayor? No. Thank you. Okay. The next panel will be uh, Kristen. Kristen Grass, a Glass, L. Mawal, L. L. Mawalas from Yorkville um, Sports. And Chant Chantel uh, from Pierre from Community Gardens. You may start, yeah. Just Hello? Wonderful. Yeah. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Kristen Glass, and I manage environmental leadership programs at the Girl Scouts of Greater New York for the, the 32,000 girls from across the five boroughs who we serve. Girl Scouts of Greater New York is a proud member of the Playfair Coalition, which we join because outdoor learning and environmental stewardship are our core hundred-year-old tenants of Girl Scouting. And because when we survey today's Girl Scouts about the issues they care about most, the environment is their number one priority. That is why we are here today calling for an increase in park maintenance funding. For so many young people and youth-serving organizations like ours, New York City parks are essential outdoor classrooms. They are unifying elements where our young people play and make lasting friendships. They are where young New Yorkers' sense of place and sense of pride are developed. Even more than infrastructure or other kinds of improvements, basic, equitable, and consistent day-to-day -day park maintenance can ensure that these spaces are the incredible places for learning and discovery that they are meant to be. Too often, your zip code determines whether you have access to the incredible benefits of parks, and that is unacceptable. Young people in all New York City neighborhoods deserve access to clean and safe green spaces. Increased funding for parks, which are currently under-maintained, will help our city realize equity in this area. I want to share a few words from Kayla, a 10-year-old in Girl Scout Troop 2054 in Brooklyn. Kayla spends a lot of time with her mom at Canarsie Park, which she says is well taken care of, but she sees differences in how parks across the city are cared for and maintained. Often other parks are not as clean, with overfilled garbage cans or no garbage cans at all. She says, 
If the parks were cleaner, it'd be much, so much nicer for me and my mom and all the other people who use city spaces to exercise and enjoy time outside. On behalf of Kayla and all the other young people in New York who want clean and safe places to learn and play, I call on the city to increase funding for our park maintenance in the upcoming budget. Lastly, I want to thank members of the Parks Committee for your advocacy in this area. The Playfair Coalition is grateful to have your support, as well as the support of the supermajority of the City Council. We are excited about continuing to work with you on this historic investment in our city parks. Thank you. You ready? Hi, I'm Chantal Fair um, on behalf of a number of community gardens, and I'm sure as Aziz Dekan had mentioned, uh, you're aware of the um, challenges we're facing with relicensing with the Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, there's quite a few things that are still contentious for us, and it really hurts the spirit of the people who have invested and volunteered their time and stewarded these spaces for 20, 30 years. Now they're elderly and are told that they have to shovel sidewalks. They may have health challenges. I personally am dealing with PTSD issues. These were therapeutic areas, places of solace and um, peace. So it's really disconcerting to see that our relationship with the Parks Department, which used to be congenial, has now turned adversarial. Um, if we're on Parks land, how does their, the shift in responsibility happen? How are now these elderly people who've been soldiers in the field, how are they supposed to take care of the sidewalks, et cetera. And uh, if they don't follow these rules set by the Parks Department, they're liable to have their license terminated. Some of them feel incredibly bullied, to be honest with you. Um, you know, it's, it's, they feel like it's a thinly disguised, thinly guised uh, way of taking back the land from the community. Um, but it just isn't right. Um, you know, the commissioner had talked about there was $8.2 million uh, given for Green Thumb Community Gardens. How is that allocated? And did they actually survey the community gardeners to see how best those allocations should be distributed? You know, it's it's beside me to understand that someone in an office can determine what's best for the soldiers in the field without asking them. So, you know, we feel that it's incredibly onerous. We respectfully um, appreciate the concern for safety of the community gardeners, but, you know, when you have a situation where perception of what's needed trumps reality, it needs to be reevaluated. And we hope that you will help us continue to fight New York Parks Department uh, and get a more fair license. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Adolfo Al Morales, and my company, Yorkville Sports has been organizing community softball and corporate leagues in Manhattan parks for over 40 years. Um, first, I'd like to thank the committee members uh, for securing more funds for our parks. Thank you. Uh, my biggest issue is maintenance, and I wanted to thank the parks also for the quick reconstruction uh, of the ball fields in, in a timely manner, uh, and that's where uh, my concern begins. Uh, in the past 40 years, uh, I've helped maintain ball fields when there was no budget, obviously, uh, no uh, workers to maintain the ball fields. So before we got on the ball fields, we had to move water and maintain the fields. And we've been doing that for 40 years up until recently, and now we're getting AstroTurf fields. Uh, but what's happened in the last, I want to say 10 years, when uh, the first AstroTurf field was uh, uh, 
placed at DeWitt Clinton uh, within two seasons, not even a full two years, that ball field became almost unusable. The turf started ripping and moving and they had to replace sections of it almost immediately. It's taken another, I don't know, another five, eight years to replace it. Uh, the problem is there are certain ball fields that are dedicated for softball and others for soccer. Uh, rectangular ball fields or fields are for soccer. And uh, I actually am going to be meeting with the Parks Department to recommend that they follow through on what their rules and regulations state that rectangular fields are for soccer and that these goals should be set, like in football, when you set up football fields, they're set for the season. They don't get moved. Uh, what's been happening is the soccer goals get pushed and shoved on and off the turf, immediately destroying it. It, it, it compromises the foundation of the turf, it starts to shift, and then it tears. I've got, I don't know if you all have it, but I gave you all a folder if, uh, if you can, the, the, the barcode, bring up the barcode. I've showed you some videos, you can see it later, of how the fields uh, and the dragging of the, uh, of the uh, nets and the, the heavy duty uh, structures have torn the field up and they've had to replace pieces of it. Uh, I am very concerned with Dewey Clinton, just got uh, reconstructed three months ago and there's already movement on fields. Uh, they're dragging metal uh, construction, uh, metal fencing, uh, metal goals on the field. Uh, that field's not going to be uh, in any good shape within the next year or two. And there's a lot of money the city and the council allocated for that field. These fields should last 20 years with the proper maintenance. So I'm really pushing hard for the correct amount of money for a ball field crew to maintain it properly every day because we don't get any ball field crew maintenance on the ball field. So we're, we're advocating heavily for a ball field crew, dedicated ball, fr uh, ball field crew. Thank, Thank you. you. Finally, this is the last one. Yeah. Thank you very much.